En un contexto global donde los desafíos trascienden fronteras, América Latina y el Caribe pueden ser una fuerza de cambio y oportunidades. La región es capaz de dar respuestas en áreas que son críticas para el futuro del planeta. La Semana de Conocimiento del Grupo BID es un espacio de encuentro único, donde construiremos puentes entre la frontera global del conocimiento y la región. Además, exploraremos cómo el conocimiento apoya políticas públicas, replicando éxitos y evitando errores. Aprende de expertos de clase mundial, construye redes y forma parte de nuestra comunidad global en desarrollo y efectividad. Regístrate ya. Good morning. Welcome once. Bonjour à tous, mesdames et messieurs. Bienvenue pour cette nouvelle journée de la semaine des connaissances. Je vais parler en anglais, comme d'habitude. Encore une fois, je répète que je suis heureuse d'être avec vous aujourd'hui et j'ai l'honneur de vous présenter un panel très particulier aujourd'hui. Tout d'abord, j'aimerais rappeler les personnes en ligne que les services d'interprétation sont à disposition de par les différents canaux. Pour les personnes présentes dans la salle, je vous invite à vous, bien vouloir vous saisir d'un écouteur pour celles qui ont besoin de l'interprétation. Et n'oubliez pas que vous aurez l'occasion de obtenir votre certificat numérique attestant de votre participation. C'est quelque chose qui se produit chaque jour à la fin de la journée. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes face à un défi mondial qui ne connaît pas de frontières, euh, qui concerne le changement climatique et la perte de biodiversité. Nous devons forger une planète saine afin d'assurer un avenir durable et inclusif. Il est essentiel de trouver des solutions efficaces afin de protéger notre environnement et de renforcer la résilience pour les... Breaking session. We're privileged to welcome all the way from University of Brasilia in Brazil, once again, Morgan Doyle, the IDB Group's representative in Brazil, with over two dec decades of invaluable experience at the IDB. His opening remarks will set a profound tone for this discussion. Guiding us through this critical conversation is Tatiana Shore. Unit Chief of the Amazon region at the IDB. Lastly, it is a privilege to introduce a true inspiration, her pioneering research on chimpanzees and unwavering advocacy for conservation has earned her numerous international awards. Her legacy, the Jane Goodall Institute for Research and Conservation in Africa stands as a beacon for scientific inquiry conservation and environmental awareness. We're honored to welcome the distinguished primatologist, etologist, anthropologist, and personal hero of mine, Jane Goodall. So hello, hello over there in Brazil. I, <laughs> I want to show you, Michael, I want to show you briefly a picture why Jane is over there. She has been in the Amazon. So if we can show the picture, Michael, for two seconds, because they send us her visit to the Amazon, we can see it on the screen. If not, I'll show you in any minute those pictures. Okay. This is Jane on the Amazon, an ambassador of life. Please continue. Thank you very much. Bon dia a todos y todos. Good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure to open this conversation today with such a special audience at the Brazilian University and with such a special guest would like to welcome uh, Jane Goodwell. Minister, the Environmental Minister Mariana Silva really wished to be here, but unfortunately, due to previous engagements, she could not be here today. So to begin, I'd like to make a special remark, a personal remark in face of the inspiring presence of Dr. Jane's. Through all her work, Dr. Jane became a uh, a reference. 
she has changed our perception of what it is to be a human being and looking and examining chimpanzees in Tanzania. In the 70s, she was also a pioneer joining people's quality of life and protection of nature. And she kept Congo the greatest sanctuary for chimpanzees in Africa. So I'm very much touched to open this seminar in face of the commitment as well as the boldness of Dr. James, who has worked for the conservation of tropical forests. It is a real honors, honor to receive her at this event, so much so that I've invited <clears throat> to this event my youngest daughter. She also wanted to be here and was very much inspired on a book which is called uh, stories for rebellious uh, girls, a book which is a reference and an inspiration to her. She even brought uh, the book to see if she, she could get a signature. So we would like to thank you. And I'd like to personally thank you to teach my daughter and future generations about the importance of the female strength. We need this energy and this uh, courage that you have. In this panel, we're going to speak about a topic that is challenging to all of us and requires the intensity that has been shown by Jane over her career, especially sustainable development in the Amazon region. We need to work together with local communities, listening to their needs and making use of geospatial technologies in order to facilitate local work. Currently, she travels a lot, always highlighting the need for conservation and always shares and highlights this topic in Africa and elsewhere. She has just returned from the Amazon and she's going to share, share her impressions on the different challenges that all of us are facing. Climate change, protecting nature, reducing poverty. Her words are even more important in face of the historical drought that the forest has been facing, as well as biodiversity and the challenges faced by local communities. The Amazon bioma might be reaching a point of no return, and this is why it is so important uh, for us to address the climate change impacts in the region. For us at IGB, the Amazon is an imperative. It is a central element of our work here and in Brazil and many other countries which compose the Amazon region. Actually, we need a holistic approach to address the forest conservation and increasing the life quality of people who live in that area. We have five pillars, but the central one is fighting deforestation by all governments, but also the economy, cities, people. It is a program that uh, intends to have the inclusion of women, local communities, and also having all of the states working together. The idea in the program is to work with partners, partners such as governments, states, federal authorities who are also here with us today. I will. I do not wish to be long, but I'd like to leave you all with this invitation. The IDB is at your disposal to work together at this so very important effort. Actually, the Amazon uh, 
takes mo more than half of all of our efforts here in Brazil, and we wish to do more. Furthermore, to me, it's a huge honor to give the floor to our guests. You've come here not to listen to me, but to listen to Dr. Jane. So once again, thank you, Dr. for having accepted our invitation. Please, you have the word. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much. So, is that better? Yes. Okay. So, I'm really sorry that for all the people outside who couldn't get in, but I greet you as well, as well as the people in front of me. And in Brazil, you have a great many primates. And as I think you probably know, I began a specific career studying chimpanzees. You know, you've got howler monkeys, squirrel monkeys, kinds of other primates. Um, but so, okay. So uh, I think you put me very close, but I was just about to greet you as I might greet actually your primates, but a sound that you don't hear in Amazonian forests, but you hear in African forests, is the chimpanzee greeting. I stand back from them. <laughs> Hello, me, Jane. So for me, it all began when I was a child. I was born loving animals. I literally was watching, according to my mother, spiders and worms and everything when I was very, very tiny. And I think perhaps the, the key to my scientific career, when I opened the door, I was four years old, staying on a farm in the country, asking everybody, where is the hole on the hen big enough for the egg to come out? And nobody told me. So I hid in a hen house and I waited for four whole hours, aged four years. And I actually saw the hen laying an egg. My mother didn't know where I was. She'd actually called the police. And then she sees this excited little girl rushing towards the house. And instead of being angry, as many mothers would be, how dare you go off without telling us, she sat down to hear the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg. I tell that story because there's the making of a young scientist, curiosity, asking questions, deciding to find out for yourself and succeeding. A different kind of mother might have crushed that early scientific curiosity. I might not have done what I've done. So I, I want to always like to start by paying a great tribute to my mother. Father didn't really come into it. He was fighting in world. So my mother had this huge impact on my life. And eventually I managed to save up to get to Africa, which was the place I most wanted to go to because of reading Tarzan and Dr. Doolittle. And so when I got there to stay with a friend, I met Dr. Louis Leakey, famous paleontologist. And it was he who gave me the opportunity to go and study not any animal. I would have studied anything to be out in the bush, but he offered me the animal most like us, the chimpanzee. We share 98.5 six, seven or eight, nobody's quite sure, percent of the composition of DNA of chimpanzee, chimpanzee differs by only just over 
1%. And they're like us in so many other ways physically. But of course, for me, the fascination was finding out the incredible similarities in our behavior. They obviously don't speak, but their nonverbal communication, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another, reassuring one another with the gentle pat or squeeze of the hand. And the males, well, males compete for dominance as a male hierarchy. And the males will stand opposite each other and they'll swagger limbs akimbo and maybe wave a branch in the air. And they remind me of very many politicians, human politicians. And the females have their own hierarchy, but it's always changing depending on whether they're with an adult son because family members stay together. But they may sometimes be with just a daughter and then a mother with a son can intimidate them. And then the next day, it may be the other way around. So it's not a very, not a very clear hierarchy. What is clear is the bond between family members. Very, very strong. Five years, the young one stays closely with the mother, sleeping in her nest, suckling gradually less and less often, riding on her back less and less often. And when the next baby is born, the child is five years old, and that child remains with the mother, emotionally dependent on her although no longer sharing her nest. And we have occasions where a mother dies. And if her infant is older than three, up until three, you are totally dependent on your mother's milk. But after that, the child may be adopted, often by an older brother or sister. But if there is no older brother or sister, then an unrelated, even adult male. So they do show altruism. Unfortunately, they also have a dark and aggressive side, just like us, again, just like us. And between neighboring communities, a community is about 50 individuals. Between these neighboring communities, there is something akin to war, very like war. And if an individual from a neighboring community is seen, males will chase and if they catch that unfortunate individual, male or female, they will be subjected to such a brutal attack that the, the victim will die of wounds inflicted. And I was a bit shocked to find out about this dark side. But as I said, it's balanced by an altruistic side as well. So I'd been in the forest about two years. And I get a message from my mentor, Dr. Leakey, saying I have to get a degree because I had no degree when I went to Africa. Couldn't afford university. He said, I've got you a place in Cambridge University in England, and we haven't got time for you to do an undergraduate degree. I've got you a place to do a PhD in ethology. So when I got there, I was nervous. You can imagine, I'd never been to university. Now I'm doing a PhD in what was the top scientific university in Britain at the time. Can you imagine what I felt when these learned professors told me I'd done everything wrong? You shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. No David Greybeard, Flo, Fifi, Goliath, and so on. They should be numbered. That's science. And they said, you can't talk about them having personality or mind capable of solving problems. And you certainly can't talk about them having emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, despair. Why? All those are unique to humans. This is back in 19, early 1960s. And it actually was thought that the gap between humans and the other animals was unbridgeable. We were separate. And it was only very gradually, as more and more film from the Gombe chimpanzees became available to science, 
that science gradually changed its mind. I didn't confront them. I just went on talking about the chimps as I knew they were, as they are. And gradually, that gap between us and the rest of the animal kingdom has closed. And now for students, the study of animal intellect is absolutely, totally fascinating and wide open. I mean, yes, we know that chimpanzees, elephants, whales, dolphins are highly intelligent. Now we find out that pigs and rats are incredibly intelligent. And I'm sure many of you have seen my octopus teacher. The amazing intelligence of this, of this octopus, and it's the same for squid. And now they're discovering it in octopuses and even some insects. So things have changed dramatically in the study of animal behavior since I was young. <clears throat> Why did I leave Gombe? Because at one time I built up a research station, very small. Gombe's tiny. I could have stayed, you know, I could still be there studying the chimps. The study is still going on. They're still finding out new facts. But I left because I helped to organize a conference in America for the first time, bringing together the people who by then were studying chimpanzees in other parts of Africa. And there were about seven, uh, seven field studies in total. And it was mainly to learn about is there something like culture in chimpanzees? Does behavior change from environment to environment? Is it passed from one generation to the next through observational learning? Well, it turns out, of course, as I'm sure you know, that that is true. We're not the only animals with culture. But at that same conference, we had a session on conservation. And it was absolutely shocking to find that in all these different study sites, chimpanzee numbers were dropping, forests were being destroyed. And I went to that conference as a scientist. I left as an activist. And I didn't know what to do. I just knew I had to do something to try to help. There was also a session on conditions in medical research laboratories. And seeing chimpanzees in five foot by five foot cages alone with nothing to do broke my heart. So that led to a very, very long fight uh, from the mid 60s until about uh, 15 years ago. 15 years ago, we finally got chimpanzees out of medical research lab. Not really for ethical reasons, but because it turned out all the experiments being done and all the experiments that were done basically were not useful for human health. Like it was thought, oh, chimpanzees will be the answer for discovering a cure for HIV AIDS. Turns out chimps, yes, you can infect them with that, but they don't develop the same symptoms if indeed they develop any symptoms at all. But leaving that aside, what about the environment? Managed to get some funding from National Geographic to visit seven different chimpanzee sites across Africa. And I learned a great deal about the problems they face, faced by primates in everywhere, really. You know, the, um, the bushmeat trade, the capturing of, of um, animals to ship them as, as pets or something like that. But at the same time as learning all about the problems faced by chimpanzees, including massive deforestation everywhere, there was the equally shocking, more shocking fact that the, so many of the people, the humans living in and around forests were suffering. They had lack of good education and health. They lacked in some places, enough to eat. They were cripplingly poor. And it came to a head. I flew over this tiny Gombe National Park where we study the chimps. That was part of a great forest belt that stretched right across Africa from the central part right to the West Coast. 
But by the early 1980s, Gombe was just a little island of forest surrounded by bare hills. More people living there than the land could support. People too poor to buy food from elsewhere, struggling to survive. Land degraded, farmland no longer fertile, cutting down the last trees to get more fertile land. And I realized that if we didn't find ways for these people to live without destroying the environment, we couldn't save chimpanzees, forests, or anything else. And so began the program uh, Take Care, known as Takari, beginning by going with a group of local people, no arrogant white people going into a very poor village and telling the people what we thought we could do to make their lives better. No. These were local people, and they went into the 12 villages around Gombe and asked the people, what do you think we can do to help? And they all said the same. They want to be able to grow more food, and they want better health facilities and better education facilities. So that's where we began, and then gradually introduced more programs like water management, bringing water from the, from the streams to the people, uh, working with women to, uh, to improve the child care, developing small clinics or improving the small clinics that were already there, and providing as many scholarships as possible to give girls a chance of secondary education or even in some cases, primary education. So improving the schools, but then giving scholarships to girls, working with mothers and infants. And gradually in these 12 villages, the people, instead of resenting us, became our partners. Then we introduced GIS, GPS, satellite imagery into the studies. And Lillian, Dr. Lillian Pintea, who's been in touch with people in, in Brazil about developing the, uh, the ESRI technology, the satellite imagery, for finding out more clearly what is going on in Brazil's forests. We're finding out a great deal about what is going on in the forests where we work with the chimpanzees. And now this technology, thanks to ESRI and Jack Dangerman, is spreading further around the world. Forests, for me, are my absolutely, absolutely most special environment. And everywhere, forests are under threat. And it's not only that they're rich, rich in biodiversity, but as you heard earlier, and of course you all know, they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And when you destroy the forest, that CO2 that's been stored in the trunk, in the roots, even in the ground sometimes, is released back into the environment. Because of climate change, then forest fires are becoming more frequent. And sad to say, forest fires are often set by people wanting to clear the land to grow crops. I didn't know too much about the Brazilian rainforest. I came here once about, I think, about 10 years ago. But we all know that the Congo Basin and the Amazonian Basin are the two great carbon sinks of the world and also two great uh, biodiversity hotspots. So coming to Brazil for me was something very important. And it happened this last visit that I just paid to one of the indigenous communities happened. And so many things happened to make that visit possible. And it enlarged my view about what's happening to the forests, but also gave me an insight into the other horrible thing going on, which is illegal gold mining. So I think this particular visit began and Malaika, Malaika Films, he was filming out in this 
a small community. And so would I go, he would like to film me there with the indigenous people. We are working very hard to develop our youth program, Roots and Shoots, in indigenous communities around the world. So this seemed a wonderful opportunity to see if our Roots and Shoots program could um, be developed uh, here. Kalimah, okay. He's, he's Malaika Films. So anyway, Kalimah Village, where is Juma, the, who founded the Juma Institute. I'm sure many of you have heard of Juma. And so he asked me to come and I said yes. And Daxter Silva was interested also, offered to fund some of this trip possible for me to come with Susanna Name, who's down some Jane Goodall Institute. And so arriving in the village, Juma's on maternity leave. She's just got this new baby, a beautiful little baby, but sadly she would be here this morning, but the baby got sick and she's at the hospital right now, which is really sad. And so there she was on maternity leave with her mother. And uh, her husband, her husband, Ugo, Ugo, Ugo Loss, he was on paternity leave in the village. And he is the chief, what's, what's his position? Uh, chief of Special Operations of Obama Institute. And I suppose you've heard of Obama Institute. So there he was. And then Greenpeace heard about this visit of mine. And they offered to, in their plane to overfly me over some of these illegal gold mining. So that's how it all came about. And it was kind of incredible how all these things happened at the same time. So I've just come out of the forest. I had a wonderful time seeing the forest, seeing some of the birds, uh, hearing howler monkeys. And, but I come out shocked, literally shocked. That overfly of the illegal gold mining. I'd heard about illegal gold mining. Buying over miles and miles of once beautiful rivers, rich in wildlife, seeing them this ochreous yellow, a sick, sick yellow. And where you see the yellow from where they've been doing the dredging with these great, great machines that dredge up the bottom of the river and pump it out so they can extract the gold. And when you see this yellow water meeting the, 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 the brown natural water, it's a shock. And I, I felt... I don't know what I felt. I haven't felt as terrible since I flew over some of Africa's forests. The plane enabled me to do that. I have to thank uh, Carol of Greenpeace for enabling that particular thing, which uh, sometimes it's hard to sleep, knowing what's going on in the world, seeing forests destroyed, seeing the number of animals who are close to extinction. I've just been in close touch with the people here in, in the Amazon studying the giant anteater, the most extraordinary animal. And there the forests are being destroyed for soy, ever more soy, ever more soy, huge fields stretching out, destroying the natural world. Giant anteaters getting killed. And there the poison is the agro, agro industry poison, the insecticides and pesticides poisoning the land, po adding their poison to the rivers too. So I'm sure some of you think about the problems that we face, and they are many. There's the, and 
everybody was telling me while I was there in that village that it was hotter than it's ever been. And it's the same as I travel around the world, which I do now. I'm about 300 days a year away from home, which is in England, traveling around the world. And everywhere, people say, where the patterns have changed. It's raining when it should be dry. The droughts are getting longer. The rainstorms are getting worse, the flooding. And it, it, it's pretty depressing. And then at the same time, there are so many suffering people, poverty, crime. The more I travel, the more problems I see. The more problems I see, the more we have to try to get together to try and solve them. We can't just sit and say, oh, well, it's nothing to do with me. If you have children, and I know one little girl right down here, uh, Amelia, I think you said your name was. So I've got grandchildren. It was way back in the early 1990s that I first began to realize that around the world, children were beginning to lose hope, mostly university students, high school and a group came to me from high school in Tanzania, from eight different schools, and they wanted me to help put all the problems right. The poisoning of the ocean with, with uh, the illegal dynamite fishing and all the other things they saw as problems, street children with no homes, sniffing glue, the bad treatment of stray dogs, the destruction of the forest. They had it all listed out. And I said, well, why don't you get all your friends together who care and we'll have a meeting. So we had a meeting. and That's when this Roots and Shoots program was born. We decided from the beginning, the main message, every single individual makes an impact on the planet every single day. And we get to choose, unless we're really poor or sick, we get to choose what sort of impact we make. And tiny impacts like deciding not to waste plastic, like deciding to eat less meat, like deciding something that you buy fewer clothes, keep them longer. Millions and millions of small choices around the world are going to make a big change. So that was our message. Every individual, that means every one of you, makes an impact every single day. And you can choose. And then we decided that each group of roots and shoots, doesn't matter how big or small, would tackle between them three projects. One to uh, do three projects. One to help people. One to help non-human animals. And one to help the environment. Or they could choose one big project which encompassed all three. But if different children in the group tackled different projects, they would share what they'd done so that that information permeated throughout the whole group. So what began with 12 high school students in is now in 70 countries. We have members in kindergarten, even a few in primary pre preschool, um, very strong in, in middle school, secondary school, university, and we're beginning to get adult groups now. We have groups for senior citizens who say, this has given us a new lease in life. We don't feel helpless anymore. And so we have programs in big corporations where the staff, sometimes if it's an international corporation, they link the children in the offices around the world. And so this Roots and Shoots program literally has hundreds and thousands of, of young people at this present time. And recently, we've had this big push from the Jane Goodall Institute to move out into the, to move out into the indigenous communities. So we started off, of course, in Tanzania, moving into the indigenous communities there, learning so much about medicinal herbs, and it turns out that much modern medicine 
actually come from indigenous knowledge of plants in the jungles and forests around the world. So we then moved into the indigenous communities in America and Canada, where it's gradually being growing stronger and stronger. And then, of course, we work with the aboriginals in, in Australia. We work with the Inuits up in Alaska. And obviously, the next thing was Latin America. So when, uh, when, when I heard about Juma, when Richie asked me to come and film and meet Juma, in fact, I should have met her before, but she had COVID, unfortunately, when she was in Europe. And so this opportunity to help develop Roots and Shoots, which is Daxter Silva's, uh, one of his goals coming here is to help develop Roots and Shoots in, in the Amazon. So all of these things kind of come together. Roots and Shoots is about giving people hope. I don't know if many of you have heard people say, well, it's too late. We've reached the tipping point. Nothing we can do now will change. Climate change is moving too rapidly. Loss of biodiversity is causing problems all around the world. It's too late. I don't know if any of you believe that. If you believe it's too late, I just feel sorry for you. And the thing is, we still, I believe, and it's not just me, there's other scientists. We've got a window of time when if we get together around the world, and start changing the way we behave, start changing the economy, then it will be too late. And that window is closing. And that's why aged almost 90, I'm still traveling 300 days a year around the world to wake people up so that everybody understands each single one of us can do something to make this a better world for our children. Roots and Shoots, as I've said, is now in about 70 countries. And I know it's going to grow in the indigenous communities of Brazil, just from what I've seen so far. Roots and Shoots is very much about hope. Young people getting together, tackling projects, making a difference, finding out that in other parts of the world, there are young people just like them also making a difference. Add up all these differences, and then the kind of change that we must have if we're going to make this a better world. I always like to talk about hope. I expect some of you saw the recent book that I did, The Book of Hope. And so many people have said to me, but Jane, you don't really have hope, do you? I don't think in my life of traveling and speaking, I've ever talked about something that I didn't believe in. I do have hope, but there is a but. There's hope that we can make change if we get together and do our bit. So I had this vision the other day, after I'd written that book, that humanity is at the mouth of a very long, very dark tunnel. And right at the end is a little star. That star is hope. It's no good sitting at the mouth of the tunnel with our arms folded hoping the star will come to us. No, we have to roll up our sleeves, climb over, crawl under, all the obstacles between us and that star. And that's beginning to happen. I see everywhere I go, groups of people who are working to try to reach the star. Collaboration, bringing people together is just tremendously important. What I just saw flying over these once beautiful rivers is something that I'm not going to forget. And it is illegal. I mean, I know there is some legal gold mining, and I think that has to change too. From my perspective, all gold mining done like this should be illegal because it is poisoning the rivers. 
It is poisoning all life living in the rivers. But it's got to be stopped. So the Obama Institute is doing extraordinary work. So when I was given this overflight, they flew me over where this last big, the biggest ever Obama operation. And I have the facts here. Of what it, was, uh, it was 70 of the... Um, The, these huge big things that are out moving slowly over the water and they're extracting the mud and, and doing it off so that the gold can be looked. So 70 of those were destroyed and 80 of the ships were destroyed. And then the, 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 the pumps uh, were destroyed. It was the biggest operation ever. And the, what does the operation entail? It entails flying over with a helicopter, dropping down, um, hoping the people on the boat run away, which they usually do, rather than shoot at you, but sometimes they shoot, and setting fire, blowing it up. And I flew over some of those, those um, huge, great machines, and they were black and burned. And that was just one operation. But the scale of this illegal gold mining is huge. It needs more than just one operation like that. They're going to do another and another. But the scale is so big that for one organization to tackle it alone, unless it gets massive funding, it's shocking. And I wonder how many of you have really thought about this. Because it's so often in a country where something's happening, the general public aren't really aware, and the government doesn't want them to be aware. So. I, I'm a changed person after this visit, but I'm a, also going back to the subject of hope. First of all, there's resilience of nature. I've seen rivers as polluted as what I just saw in the last few days in Canada. And in Canada, this entire area was uh, tin mining, copper mining. The rivers were totally, totally dead. Nothing was there. The hills were black. And finally, the people of Sudbury decided to do something about it. It's been going on now for 20 years. But those rivers and lakes where we were, um, I went there ages ago and was told we can never clean up these rivers and lakes. They're too badly polluted. Not true. They're clean. And I saw the loons and I saw the fish. Nature is amazingly resilient if we give her a chance. Forests in the Brazilian basin that are being cleared for soy with all the industrial poisons that that involves, the forest will come back given time and some help. And the indigenous people are there, willing, ready, wanting to bring back the forest, to clean the water. They rely on it. It's their home. That we're destroying. And why do we need all this gold, really and truly? Could we do without gold? Suppose most of us could. Not even any longer in Britain, anyway. It used to be the wealth of Britain was measured in her gold stocks, but that's not true anymore, so I'm told. So, anyway, we don't really need gold. We certainly don't need the amounts of gold. And if we do need that gold, then we must use our scientific intellect and find ways of extracting gold without destroying the environment. That's the alternative. And we're finding alternatives to climate change and things, which 20 years ago, people would have said, oh, we'll never have this amount of solar power, or we'll never be able to develop wind power, and so on. So when scientific minds get to work, when the ordinary public uh, gets angry and wants change, then amazing things can happen. And nature is incredibly resilient. And animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. It's a great reason for hope. 
the biggest reason of all is the young people. Once they decide that they're going to do something to make change, my goodness, their energy and enthusiasm is just incredible. And then another reason for hope, and perhaps the greatest, is the resilience of nature. I'm sorry, is, is the indomitable human spirit. And I wish that Juma and Ugo were here this morning with us. I was going to introduce them to you as two unbelievably indomitable spirits. Juma traveling around the world, talking about the plight of, of her people. Ugo risking his life again and again to do something about the illegal gold mining. But at least we have a film record being made of it, thanks to Malaika. And so now I hope that this message has gone out beyond this room. Because it is it's up to all of you, it's not up to me. I'm not Brazilian. Uh, but from Brazil must come the answer. From Brazil. Brazil can restore the forests and clean the rivers and be proud of a very, very beautiful, environmentally rich country. So thank you all for being here and sorry to those of you in another room. And I think there's time now for some questions. Thank you. I didn't introduce Mr. H, <laughs> this indomitable human spirit. Mr. H was given to me 32 years ago. He was given to me by a man who went blind. He was in the U.S. Marines. He went blind and he decided to become a magician. Very strange, blind man doing magic. But he, he arranges his props beforehand. He does show they don't know he's blind. At the end, he tells them and says, well, you know, it may go wrong in your life. We never know. Don't ever give up. There's always a way forward. And he does skydiving. He does cross-country skiing. Most amazing. He's taught himself to paint. He gave me Miss, Mr. H. His name is Jeff. Horn. Mr. H. 32 years ago thinking he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee. I made him hold the tail. Chimpanzees don't have tail. He said, never mind, take him with you, and you know I'm with you in spirit. So Mr. H has traveled to 62 countries, and he, he's been touched by about 6,000 6, million, I mean, million people, because I say the inspiration. Thing Gary's done, which is so amazing. He taught himself to paint. And I have a portrait of Mr. H, which he's only felt he's never seen him. Unbelievable. The indomitable human spirit. First, let's breathe, right? That was very, very inspirational. I think 
we all need a little moment, you know, like to just sink in all these words. And thank you very much. I think not only for today, but I think most of us here and those that are listening to us have been involved in nature due to the large and extensive work you've done. So I think for me, this is the most impactful um, work you have ever done is to inspire. Now, inspire young people to become ecologists, to become primatologists, to become anthropologists, to become activists. And I think this is a legacy which you will see not only in this full room, in the other full room, and I bet you've seen it all over the place, of how important and how inspirational your work has been for us. Yeah. People. Okay. That better? Yes. <laughs> I should have had one of these while I was talking. It's very hard to keep so still with that. So this this is much better. <laughs> um, I wasn't offered it, by the way. <laughs> so uh, we hope that one of the things that, that Roots and Shoots has inspired children to be is good human beings. I mean, if you're a decent human being, that comes first. If you're a, not a decent human being, you won't be a nice scientist. And you'll do all those cruel experiments that people do, which they couldn't do if they were a really decent human being. Totally. I think that is, that is the key, right, to, to whatever we do in life, no matter where you are and what part of science you're doing, right? And especially for economists. And, and the, I'm an economist, so I'm saying this is also valid for yeah. us. Good. There's a series of questions which we've been getting through the, the WhatsApp and getting through the internet. I've received them and I've bundled them into three categories, which I think are very much what people here would like to hear. The first category, the first set of questions is related to science and primatology and related to how do you see the future of this science? How do you see the future and how would you like the future of the study of in primatology to look like? So there's a lot of primatologists here. There's the Brazilian Association of Primatologists, the Women's Association of Primatologists in Brazil, the Department of Primatologists, and a lot of primatology students. So this is, this is a question for you. Okay, well, I see primatology as moving into more and more areas where the primates live. And, you know, there are still many primates. We know virtually nothing about them. And the more we learn, like, let, let's take one of your, let's take your howler monkeys. And I suspect that if the, if the, the Amazonian basin, all the different howler monkey groups are studied, there'll be so much about howler culture and howler maybe dialect. And all these things are absolutely fascinating in relation to how, how we humans evolved. And then also in, in primatology in many countries, there's a growing problem of primates raiding human crops and human food, and that makes big conflict. So there are groups of primatologists now trying to work out how to minimize this human-animal conflict. Um, I hope that we will see the end of all primates in medical research. And one reason is when, when the director of National Institute of Health in America, uh, when he came, and, came in as director, I happened to be sitting next to him right at the very, very beginning. And I talked to him about the chimps in these five foot by five foot cages. And he said, oh, I don't know anything about chimps. I'm a geneticist. It was Francis Collins who unraveled the human genome. So I proceeded through dinner to tell him about the chimps. So he got a team of 11 scientists. Uh, he allowed three, three of our people to go examine every single experiment being done. Uh, two questions. Is it um, beneficial to human health? Two, is it potentially beneficial? 
And after 18 months, with about 400 studies, the answer was zero to both questions. So he said, right, sanctuary. So they're all in sanctuaries except a few very old ones who they feel can't be moved. So we want all primates and actually all animals out of medical research. And the proof is coming more and more and more. We don't need them. Very few instances where they're needed. It can all be done much better with um, all these, you know, electronic systems and so on. Organs on a chip. And, and from the science into another group of questions is a mix of science and activism, which we look into you and see very clearly that activism as activism and our role as humans into the activism for nature, for the animals. I heard you talked a lot about this, but there's a lot of questions of wanting to hear you more and how can activism be effective today? Okay, well, I think um, the effectiveness of activism has changed. Right at the beginning, it was necessary, like if you think of, you know, women, the women suffragettes in the early days, chaining themselves to fences, something needed to be done to wake people up to what was happening. And the same with primatology. The early people were breaking into labs and stealing animals, which wasn't always very successful. But it did, you know, rouse people's, well, gosh, I didn't even know this was going on. We passed that time. People know what's going on. And certainly in my, <clears throat> in, in, in my own experience, Uh, I think I'm just that kind of person, luckily, I think. Um, being aggressive doesn't work. I mean, think when I was a young woman, and most of these people who were conducting primate research at that time were men. And there's no good me going up and pointing a finger and saying, you're doing this, and do you realize, do you realize, you're... they're just not going to listen. If they do listen, they'll be thinking about how can I How can I prove that she's wrong? So when all those people were attacking me when I was at Cambridge, talking about chimpanzees with personalities and so on, I just went on doing it and proving it by showing it. But you can't always do that. But I do think that the way to make change, you've got to find a way to reach the heart. If you can reach the heart, you can do that for me, by telling a story, find, find out a little bit about who you're talking to or the group you're talking to, what they think, why they think it. Find a story that's going to get past their initial rejection of you into the heart. And you may not know at the time, but you've sown a seed. And I've known that happen, you know, quite, quite often. Very interesting. I think the, 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 the way to approach the question and the problem and the people is extremely important. And I think that's a lot what we see in difficulties here in terms of how to deal, for example, with the illegal mining that we were saying. So the way to approach those people and the way to talk about it, I think, is extremely important. Yeah, but also I, you've just reminded me of something I should have said earlier, uh, which is very important with this gold mining. Um, when we began our Tukari program, which, you know, we're now ready to, to spread out around the world. We bought this book, Local Voices, Local Choices, how to stop them cutting down the forest, find alternative ways of living. And so when shutting down the illegal gold mining with the people who are living in poverty and trying to get some money, so that's going to be an important aspect Of, of shutting down the illegal gold mining is to find what can they do? What can we offer them? How can they make a living? For me, lately, as head of the Amazon coordination unit, and I, your book was very inspirational. The one, especially the one, this one that described how the Takari Institute works and a little bit describes how the roots and shoots function. I think there looking into the Amazon, not only the Brazilian Amazon, but looking into the Amazon region, I can see a very important inspirational, and not only inspirational, but also like a methodology, a way to work. 
And that takes us to the third set of questions that have appeared here is, you're here in Brazil, you went to the Amazon. So what is the future of Jane Goodwell Institute in Brazil? How, how are you seeing your role? And this is what we most want to hear in terms of not only the conservation of the primates in the Amazon, but also of the Amazon in its, all, its whole social ecological aspect. Okay, well, first of all, let me, let me make clear the Jane Goodall Institute, there are 27 Jane Goodall Institutes. And um, if a, a Jane Goodall Institute came to Brazil, it would be the Jane Goodall Institute Brazil. However, Roots and Shoots is beyond, Roots and Shoots can be anywhere as long as it abides by, you know, those principles, non-aggressive, peaceful, things like that. So the Jane Goodall Institute uh, or Jane Goodall in Brazil depends on the Brazilians, not me. It depends if, if Jane Goodall or the Institute is wanted. If there's anybody who says, well, gosh, you know, I'd love to join that global movement and I'd love to see it develop here and I'd love I'd love to be the director of the Jane Goodall Institute in Brazil. Isha. <laughs> but the, the person's got to be the right person. You know, they, we don't want aggressive people. We don't want, uh, you know, some, some groups are, are, are just labeled as being really aggressive and, and like this. We, we're not like that. We're much more like gentle, like infiltrating into the, when the tide comes in, you know, we're like the tide gently coming in, bringing life. How, how do you see all that the Jane Goodwill, Amazonia, not only, so of course we're here, but I bet we're being listening to all, of, all the Amazonian countries. Absolutely. How, how, how can you see, you know, like, Give us a little bit more of hints of how you would see it effectively working. Are there like, um, should we should we look into what has been done in African examples? Should we look into roots and shoots? What 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 road should we choose? Well, roots and shoots definitely. I, I'm wanting to see roots and shoots everywhere, and you know we are in these seventy countries. We're by the way very strong in China. Um, unfortunately, not in Russia. Unfortunately, not in Ukraine. Um, we're in Israel, but not really in Palestine. So you see what, what I'm getting at, which is uh, a role in reducing conflict. Uh, so we, uh, we do have a Jane Goodall Institute, Chile, Colombia, um, <clears throat> um, Argentina. So we, we've sort of made some inroads. We've got roots and shoots in more Latin American countries and in Mexico. So it's really a question of giving, for me, to give some talks, for other people to kind of follow up, like we're following up with the Esri, for example. With a, yeah. um, but the right people kind of appear. The right people come along. And unless the right person wants to take on a role, it won't happen. I mean, does that answer you? Almost. Not quite. Okay, what's the rest <laughs> because, of it? No, just the last, I think the last, it's still in this vision of, of how, how, how we should look into this possibility. Maybe I think we could hear a little bit more from you about the roots and shoots. I think, I think it would be interesting because the Takari uh, example, there's a big role for teachers. And I, I think maybe there's a lot of teachers listening to us here. And so maybe if, if you could talk a little bit, if they're interested in bringing Roots and Shoots to their school, what is the path? How, where should they reach? Who should they talk? Well, um, <clears throat> who should they talk to? We, I haven't talked enough to enough people. Maybe you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we should take that role on. I do. So... Basically, Roots and Shoots can be started by a teacher in any school. Uh, they, they need to do the three things, animals, people, environment. They need to be non-aggressive. And it's about, it's the great thing about Roots and Shoots, it's flexible. So Roots and Shoots in New York would be very different from 
roots and shoots in the village where I just was in Karima. Um, roots and shoots in Argentina will be very different from roots and shoots in Germany. It's flexible. It grows to solve the problems that are there locally. And it is a level of sophistication according to the age of the participants. So kindergarten kids won't do the same as university students. Well, they might. They might all plant trees. So planting trees is a big part of what we do. <clears throat> but also raising awareness, raising money for, uh, you know, we have lots of <clears throat> roots and shoots, raising money for Ukrainian refugees, for example, Palestinians. We have roots and shoots raising money for conservation groups, efforts, and so on. And I haven't yet got any roots and shoots. I just love these. Have you ever seen a giant anteater? They're wonderful, aren't they? Do you know the people studying them? Yeah. Yeah, because I want to go and see them one day, but I don't suppose I ever will. Or who you can have? help us? Well, because I, I read all the reports about this study, and it's just so sad they're being hit by cars. It's all over the world, isn't it? So basically, to answer your question, roots and shoots can start anywhere. It doesn't even have to be a school. We have a, we have a granny group. It's a, uh, two grandmothers and their daughters and sons and grandchildren and one great-grandchild. <laughs> so it, it can be any group of people who want to make the world a better place. Good. So <laughs> I got the message. That, and and yeah. te teachers do, we, in, in Tanzania, we have um, teacher workshops. And we did also in Argentina and I think in one of the other countries, Chile maybe, um, teacher workshops so that they all understand their role in Roots and Shoots, which is basically not to dictate, but to encourage and empower the children. Well, our time is, is, is over. Is over and university, of course, is one of the best university students are developing roots and shoots in high schools and some in kindergarten and teacher training and all the rest of it. Okay, that's enough. Um, I have, before we finish, I've had two special, I had many requests, but two um, very special. One is from the Women's, Brazilian Women's Association for Primatologists. The other one is here from the university, from the group of professors of primatology in the University of Brasilia that they would like to come up. So one of each group, please, and to bring you a little gift and a thank you. So please, one of each. Think she's a primatologist because of James. So, voila, voila. It's just very emotional. So, <laughs> abraço. I'm asking her. She wants to hug me. That's that's more than everything. <laughs> Então, é o que ela está pedindo para eu explicar em português, que isso é um típico relacionamento. She's asking me to explain that in Portuguese. This is the typical chimp behavior, and it says everything.
Há um quadro... It's always very emotional when Jane appears on a stage. We are going to do a small break so we can continue, of course, but I hope you had... Okay, so, just one minute. Okay, she's going to receive a lot of gifts. This always That's happens when Jane, emotion. she comes like to great a stage. Pleasure. It's, it's great impressive. It's to have you here. I would like to thank you. Okay. Thank you all here, the, the, the audience, and I think, yeah. She will receive this applause, definitely. Little recess, recess time for 10 minutes, I guess. I don't know what time is it, but we have like 13, 12 minutes and then we'll reconvene here. Thank you very much. Did you like it? Beautiful, huh? Have you read Hope already? Who had read Hope? The book.
I'm excited to continue today's schedule. Before we proceed, let me remind you that we're offering simultaneous interpretation in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, both for in-person audience and our online viewers. So please select the language that suits you best. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at a critical juncture in addressing climate change in the Latin America and Caribbean region. The escalating threats of rising temperatures, extreme events, and sea level rise are particularly daunting for vulnerable communities. To combat this, effective adaptation strategies are essential as they not only protect lives and ecosystems, but also en en enhance the resilience and sustainable development. Today, we're honored to have a panel of distinguished experts to delve into the crucial topic Launching today's conversation with insightful opening remarks is Anton Edmonds, General Manager of the Caribbean Region in ADV. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think you can hear me and the, the effect of a, a little bit of coming out of a little bit of a flu here. The voice is a little bit deeper, so hopefully it projects a little bit better. But that's it. Good morning. I address you today on a matter of significance and one that demands our urgent attention. Climate change adaptation in Latin America and the Caribbean. Let there be no doubt that home to nearly 660 million people, this region is faced with the pro profound and escalating impacts of a warming climate. climate. Warming planet. Flu. Let me begin with the numbers, which underscore the scale of the challenge. During the last 50 years, the number of natural disasters in Latin America and the Caribbean region has increased more than threefold. Extreme weather events are becoming more frequent and severe, affecting millions. Rising sea levels, extreme heat waves, and shifting rainfall patterns are all becoming the new norm, a very destructive one. The impacts are palpable as from 2000 to 2019, this region, our region, suffered economic losses of approximately $377 billion due to climatic events. Recent trends show that for every 10 disaster-related deaths in our space, four of them are caused by climate and meteorological events, which also accounts for over 70% of economic losses. The challenges are particularly stark for Caribbean islands and low-lying countries, which are amongst the 25 nations with greater exposure to natural disasters. These countries, these are countries where natural disasters and hazards destroy an average of 3.6% of GDP every year, and as home to nearly 45 million people, statistics are not mere data points. They represent lives, livelihoods, and entire communities hanging in the balance. In a conversation last week with the Minister of Agriculture in Jamaica, we were discussing the export of yam to the United States and its value in terms of foreign exchange and employment, with him lamenting the fact that increased drought and weather instability is threatening this year's crops and the lives of many. And while reports are still trickling in, the damage wrought on Acapulco by Hurricane Otis this week look apocalyptic. There is increasingly everyday examples around us of the impact of climate change and the need for adaptation. At the IDB, we acknowledge that it is not possible to reduce poverty without reducing vulnerability to climate change and vice versa. The business case is clear. Investing $1 in resilience in Latin America and the Caribbean will save $4 in the reduction of damages in the short term. In this sense, the IDB has an established track record of bridging the development gaps through climate ad adaptation, and two projects come to mind. 
One is in the Bahamas, where we are funding urgently needed upgrades to transportation systems, embedding within the effort a wider program to improve coastal resilience. As a result, not only is road access improved for a number of households, but also the number of people affected by storms and floods is being reduced by 5% over the next three years. And over 9,000 Bahamians are benefiting for, from a more sustainable management of mangroves along the coastline. The second example is Paraguay, where lagoon and wetland restoration is helping reduce river flood risks while bringing green infrastructure to vulnerable neighborhoods that historically lacked the means to manage stormwater surge. These communities will no longer have to dread the consequences of waking up to a flooded home or potentially losing everything due to rainfall. The IDB is innovating in terms of the provision of financing tools, such as our debt for nature swaps in Barbados and in Ecuador, and our hurricane clause, which, which is designed to provide cash flow relief at the crucial period after a natural disaster event. The latter will provide breathing room for governments, allowing the reallocation of resources to provide relief to communities that have been hit or to attend to critical infrastructure that may have been destroyed. This year, IDB Invest and Banco Boliviano issued the world's first blue bond with target-based incentives which will give MSMEs access to credit so that they can participate in the supply and value chain of the sustainable production of marine industries such as fishing and aquaculture and also in the renewable energy space, generating income while promoting conservation efforts. And as part of the Latin America Water Funds Partnership, the IDB is fostering nature-based solution projects such as forest and wetland restoration to enhance water security in 25 cities across Latin America and the Caribbean. Based on these experiences and the best available evidence, we know that climate adaptation generates cost savings, protects assets, safeguards livelihoods, and catalyzes investment for development. For all these reasons, the IDB Group has been placing climate resilience and sustainable infrastructure at the core of a new phase of effective development support for the region. We are currently preparing the 2024 Development in the, Ameri in the Americas flagship report on climate, which will present cutting edge research and propose policy solutions on this matter. Today's discussions will be a call to action, a call to harness our collective wisdom, innovation, and resolve, all to safeguard this cherished region for the current and future generations. I look forward to the deliberations on practical solutions and the concrete steps we can take to address the pressing need for climate change adaptation in our region. It is possible. And while we at the IADB continue to strive to develop a human-centric approach to sustainable development, success will require a collective effort by all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much to Anton for those uh, powerful words. Guiding this discussion is our esteemed moderator, Sofia Viguri, a climate change specialist at IDB. And joining them, we have an exceptional lineup, including Ilan Noy, Chair in the Economics of Disasters and Climate Change at the University of Wilmington, Catherine Jadot, Advisory Board Member of Blue Ocean Future, BOF, Ricardo Marshall, Director of the Roofs to Reefs Program, M Barbados, and Ethan Sindler, climate counselor and leader of the Climate Hub at the U.S. Treasury. Let's extend them a warm welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in this important panel, and thank you to Ambassador Edmonds for those remarks. Uh, they personally hit home because I am from Mexico, so my heart and my prayers go to all those affected by Hurricane Otis um, and a million people in the city of Acapulco that 
are seeing their livelihoods uh, completely transformed from today on as a consequence of this catastrophic event. Uh, this all serves to make it clear to us that business as usual in development projects is not viable anymore. It is our responsibility, especially as development professionals, uh, to lead the way in managing these uncertainties of, of climate change. And so I thank deeply all the members of this panel in joining us here for this important conversation. So we will focus on how development projects um, need to change. Uh, and we're seeking to really motivate us all, no matter what sphere of influence we work on in the academia, in government, you know, to, to really rethink the way uh, we, we address development. So I, uh, we will start with the first round of questions. I kindly remind each speaker that uh, each have approximately four minutes to respond. So thank you for being mindful of the time. And let's start with Catherine. So I know that you have a lot of experience working uh, across multinational ecological systems, uh, for example, the Caribbean, the Caribbean, Caribbean sorry. Um, so I'm under, I am interested in understanding how you see this cross-border collaboration as being critical for effectively addressing uh, climate change impacts. Can you provide us with one or two examples uh, of regional initiatives that you think uh, proved how, how this approach can improve adaptation-based projects? Sure, absolutely. I think that cross-border collaboration is absolutely crucial in making sure that climate adaptation efforts are successful, and, and that for different reasons. First of all, um, of course, it's because the impact of climate change are not only felt within the confinement of one specific border, right? They are transboundary by nature. So our actions, our efforts ought to be of the same level if we really want to see an effective adaptation. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, I also wanted to say that very often in small island developing nation, be in the Caribbean or anywhere in the world, very often resources are limited. It can be capital, manpower, knowledge, time. So by pulling resources together, those small island nations can ensure that they have the most effective answers and uh, impact um, to be better adapted to climate change. So one example that I would like to, to refer to it's a very successful project I had the privilege to be part of in the Caribbean. It's a project called Resembit. Uh, it's the Resembit program that is funded by the European Commission and uh, implemented by Expertise France. And this program um, helped increase the sustainability of those regions. And after talking to all the different stakeholders in 12 different Caribbean islands, we realized that very often one problem that was in one specific island was also the same problem that was faced in another island. But stakeholders in those different islands were not connected to each other. They were not aware of the solutions that could be implemented. They, they were not aware of what is working? What is not working? Who are the experts? What are the capital that is available to implement that specific um, adaptation? So we set up a community of practice to really promote the exchange of knowledge, to have brainstorming session, to, have, to open the door to a little bit more of um, exchanges between the islands. And, and one very successful example is two islands, uh, two sister islands, two Dutch islands, uh, St. Eustatius, Eustatia and Seba. They had very similar problem of runoff due to deforestation. deforestation. Mm -hmm. And one island, Eustatia, knew what type of um, trees would resist to the consistent wind that you would have on those islands. Sure, you have empirical study that shows that, you know, the gumbo bum will resist very well to, to hurricane, but what, what are specific, the specific um, uh, trees and essence that need to be planted? So we establish a nursery from one island to another one and really help train rangers from Seba into Stasia. And they've been planting trees so far, um, using the knowledge from one island to another one, creating bridges between different communities. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like really that community knowledge being spread around is really critical because it also matters who 
brings the knowledge to adapt. Absolutely. No? So, so thank you so much for that excellent example. So I'm going to turn to Ricardo. I'm sorry that I had my back on you. So Ricardo, Marshall, thank you. Um, you, you um, you're from Barbados, and we've heard so much about the Roofs to Reefs program uh, in Barbados here at the IDB. Um, this, uh, this country, like many island nations, faces very unique challenges uh, related to natural disasters. And so uh, we know that you lead on this resiliency effort uh, and, and this vision, grand vision for resilient development in the country. How, in your opinion, how has the Roofs to Reefs program changed that business as usual that we were talking about in Barbados? And can you provide some concrete examples of a certain project that you saw, you know, really changed the way it would have been under a business as usual scenario and, and now? taking into account these mounting impacts of climate. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. Um, good morning, all. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, let me say, first of all, that the Roofs to Reefs program is a holistic vision to address climate resilient development across Barbados, looking at both public and private sector development. <clears throat> It starts by connecting at the policy level nationally. And so it is directly related to our physical development plan. It's directly related to our nationally determined contributions, or NDC. Um, you will, if you look into our Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Plan, you will see it referenced specifically there. It is connected directly to the work that we're doing with respect to the Marine Spatial Plan, as well as to work that we're doing on resilience targets and developing an overall resilience roadmap for Barbados. That interconnectivity allows us to ensure that we have that overall national policy coverage that then cascades down to the individual sectors. And then you will see those sectoral policies leading into sectoral programs and then into individual projects. And then you have the feedback loop that takes it from the individual project all the way back up to the national level. And this really has allowed us to tackle climate resilience in a holistic manner. It means, therefore, that you are integrating into all areas. We've identified six key sectors or fundamental building block sectors. These are housing, water, energy, waste, land use, which includes agriculture. Um, it includes your physical infrastructural development and ecosystems. And when you touch on those six fundamental building blocks, they touch on everything else, whether it is education, it is health, it is information technology. And by integrating in that way, you find that you will get that integrated response at the project level. And to give you a simple example, we have been doing work on the upgrade of the major highways, mm -hmm. starting with the coastal highways that run along um, from north to south and from east to west. So that is Highway 1 and Highway 7. And the Roofs to Reefs program allowed us to be able to integrate into those projects that climate resilient development so that you're building more resilient infrastructure going forward. And it pulls different infrastructural components together from coastal protection through to stormwater management to undergrounding of utilities and to ensuring that you're building in that holistic manner. It also gives us the program that we take forward um, when we're looking for funding externally, whether it is the GCF, it is the IDB, it is the World Bank, wherever, so that you're demonstrating that you have that holistic, programmatic approach in order to improve your individual projects and to ensure that all of your key stakeholders are covered. I think key stakeholders is the key because 
this complexity of an integrated approach of it comes with that trade-off. No? We have to designate more time and more space to bring everyone to the table, but once we do, we get these projects that are more solid and, and have that long-term vision that the... Verb, the I, I think key, Sophia, is that you have to do all that you can very early in the process in your stakeholder identification, your stakeholder mapping, and your stakeholder relations. And Rooster Reese really is just building on something that we started many, many years ago in our approach to projects in Barbados. Every major project is run through a project steering committee. And then at the national level, we have a tripartite agreement between government, private sector, labor, and the rest of the third sector. And they all meet quarterly. And if your project or program is on the list, you're expected to turn up, report, answer any questions that come from anywhere, and it keeps us moving positively in that respect. Well, that's actually a, an excellent segue to my question for Mr. Ethan Sindler. Thank you, Ethan, for being with us, because I wanted to touch upon the private sector, the role of the private sector as a stakeholder. We know that the scale of the challenge cannot be met by public uh, funds only, or public will uh, uh, only. Uh, it is very uh, important to galvanize this joint public and private action. So can you share with us an example of a successful partnership between government and businesses to prepare, cope, and, and respond to climate change in, in, in the uncertain, uncertainties it brings? Sure. Th well, first, thank you, and thanks for, for the invitation here today. Um, and by just quickly by way of introduction, I'm, I'm Ethan Zindler. I'm the new climate counselor to Secretary Yellen, um, and in that role, I'm across a, a wide variety of climate-related topics. Um, but um, I just joined, in, in my, my prior life, I worked for Bloomberg NEF, which is a research firm focused a lot on the private investment um, in the climate and clean energy space. So I might try and draw a little bit off, um, off that uh, past expertise in answering your question. Because I do think, as we think about ad adaptation, we, you know, we've seen this, this surge of investment in climate-related uh, funding over a trillion dollars is what Bloomberg NEF was tracking. Um, but adaptation is often the more challenging angle for the private sector to um, really, frankly, see a, a, um, a road to earning a return on investment. Um, and there are opportunities, and I think it requires a bit more creativity, though, um, than if you, say, fund a wind or solar project that signs a long-term power pur purchase agreement that has a clear set of cash flows, and it's not that hard to explain to a credit uh, committee. It can be a good, more, bit, good bit more challenging when you're trying to explain why reinforcing a seawall where something reduces risks and thus has a financial benefit, but it's a little more subtle um, overall. Um, but just for a moment on, on Treasury, in terms of some of the things that, you know, that we're working on, I would just say one thing, which is just you know, a lot of what we spend our time on these days is um, working on the Inflation Reduction Act, which is this law passed about a year ago, which is the most ambitious climate uh, legislation ever um, in U.S. history. Um, a lot of it is, of course, focused on mitigation, but there is some of it and some small amount of it that is focused on adaptation um, as well. And I realize it's primarily a domestic policy, but I, I kind of raise it in the, in the context of it providing other opportunities for other countries to trade with the U.S. Uh, in order to support what is going to be a very rapidly um, growing market um, overall uh, that we see for clean energy products and for adaptation efforts here um, in the U.S. as well. Uh, as, as most of you know, Treasury it, itself is not um, a, a direct funder of, uh, of projects for the most part. Um, what we do is that we um, help to oversee the funds that the U.S. government puts into the multilateral development banks, of course, um, but also the Green Climate Fund uh, and the multilateral, uh, sorry, the, um, the uh, climate investment funds and the Global Environment Facility. Um, so, you know, I would say th there's efforts there that I think have been uh, useful. And the GCF um, says that about half the funding that they've put in to climate-related stuff has been focused on adaptation, which I think is a, is a positive thing. Uh, in addition, of course, I, I get, you know, on behalf of the you know, broader U.S. government, um, the Development Finance Corporation 
um, has made headlines in the last six months or so, in fact, last year or so, by issuing some interesting blue bonds that have, in fact, incorporated private sector participation in terms of providing uh, ecological protections in, in uh, the Galapagos, in Gabon. Uh, I know they're working on other projects as well. Um, and so in those cases, they have been able to bring in, in one case, Bank of America, and in another case, Credit Suisse, to provide some of the uh, uh, ability to offset some of the risks that those investments require. Wonderful. Well, I, I hear a lot of things that we actually are, are uh, helping to implement here at the bank because IDB Invest is really leading the way on blue bonds as well. Our work with the GCF and the C in the CIF, uh, I remember that uh, actually this approach that the climate investment funds have to being a, like a first having a program, a program, no, like a programmatic approach that brings public and private sector to the table actually helps a lot you know, to start making these connections between uh, the, the stakeholders and businesses. But I think that's a great uh, way to, to, um, to address our, our final member of the, of the panel, Elan, because he's, uh, he's joining us from New Zealand. So thank you, because I realize that the time difference must be very large. Uh, but he's uh, the chair of the economics department at the university, where he leads uh, really the quantification of, of the impacts of climate change and, and natural disasters. And maybe some of those uh, numbers can, can help sensibilize no, to the private sector and make it more real, as you say, about what's the, the actual cash flow. Uh, that, that we can argue. But I wanted to ask uh, Elan in particular, uh, you know, we've, we've read about, you know, the, the most recent IPCC report, the sixth report, uh, we, it says that in some cases we must be prepared um, to do that economic analysis and acknowledge that in some instances there are hard limits to adaptation. So instances where adaptive actions are not feasible anymore uh, to manage the impacts of climate change. Uh, and what we have to do is a managed retreat. So I wanted to touch about this difficult, around this difficult subject for us in, in the development world, no? And can you share an example of how you've incorporated new methods into, the, into your work and hopefully with the policy and planning process to determine the trade-offs between investing in, in adaptation in, in a particular location and then managing retreats in, in another location? We'd, we'd welcome your remarks and, and perspectives on this. Thank you, Ilan. Um, Kiova, bon dia, and uh, buenos dias a todos. Um, I start by apologizing for two things. First of all, I want to apologize for towering over all the other panelists. <laughs> that has definitely not been my intention. Um, and I am a bit embarrassed that I'm so big on that big screen behind everyone. Um, the second apology is I'm not from the region. Uh, my only saving grace is that I'm married to a Mexican, uh, <laughs> but otherwise I'm not from the region and I will give examples not from the region, uh, but I think they apply everywhere. Um, I want to start by noting that uh, in sort of recent um, estimates, we, we calculated that from extreme weather events, the climate change part of extreme weather events is now already costing the world about $140 billion a year. So this is, a, a, is an urgent and present problem. It's not a future problem that we need to, um, to deal with. The fact that climate change is already causing these extra $140 billion um, of pain a year. Um, the other point I want to make is that a lot of times our policies are sort of, we realize that the risk has changed after an event. So an event happened and then we realize that the risk has changed and we are, um, usually then we scramble to decide what to do. Um, so in this dichotomy between do we adapt, do we say put on seawalls or put on dikes or put on stop banks or do some other protection or do we retreat? And I prefer the word relocation rather than retreat. It sounds a bit less defeatist. Mm -hmm. um, but um, that decision in a post-disaster situation is usually not not the, it's very difficult to make the, the optimal decision in a, in a post-disaster situation when there is an urgency involved. So if there is sort of the first lesson here, I think, is we need to plan for the disaster when it happens so that we are not scrambling post-disaster for these decisions to be taken. Um, the other point is that this dichotomy between do we adapt, do we build the seawall, or do we retreat to re relocate, it is a very difficult choice. 
Um, it first of all, it depends. We need a lot of science behind it, so we need to understand what is how how the pattern of cl the climate is changing. So we need the atmospheric scientists involved, and then we need the hydrologists to understand what that means in terms of water and movement of uh, flooding and and drought risk and all of these other risks that manifest because the climate um, is changing. Um, and then we need the economists to understand um, what is the cost of both these two options. So how much will it cost us to relocate and how much will it cost us to, to adapt? Um, and we need, but we don't need only economists, we need other social scientists, we need sociologists to understand what is the cost to the community other than the economic costs. Um, and we need to understand what are the, the, the cultural issues that are at play here. Uh, in many places, the communities have specific cultural ties to the, to, the, to the location where they're in, which makes it much more difficult to decide to relocate. And we need to understand those issues, and and may may also mean that they have some preference to some preferences in term in in terms of where to relocate to. Um, you know, one sort of a striking example of that, maybe the most extreme example I know, is is the island nation of Tuvalu in the Pacific. This is a this is a nation that will most likely by the end of the century will no longer be um, viable um, because the tallest, the, the highest place in the in the country is about two three meters above um, sea level, um, and it and it's a it's a country of ten thousand people, so it's it's much easy, it's it's pretty easy to just move them somewhere else um, and relocate them to maybe my country to out there on New Zealand, um, but of course there is you know there's there are consequences to um, to getting rid of a country to put it bluntly. Uh, and we need to take those considerations into um, the, our decision making in terms of uh, both the mitigation, but also the, the, the decision on adaptation versus um, relocation. Uh, so it's a very difficult choice. Um, and we and the other part of that is not only doesn't only involve the all the science part from from the climate scientists to the um, sociologists and the economists and so forth. It also involves politicians who have their own sort of incentives, um, which are very different from, from what the optimal decision-making necessarily is. Um, but of course we live in, at least most, many of us live in democracies and, and, and our politicians are the ones who are tasked with, with the decisions on what to do in those cases. So we need to take that into account. Um, and and there is also a tension a lot of times between the local community and, and the regional community or the national community. Uh, in terms of what to to decide, and again, that's something that needs to be um, taken um, considered. The last thing I want to point out is that we have a lot of science that so shows that, in terms of climate change impacts, it's mostly the socially vulnerable communities that are most affected. Uh, and here again, we need to decide how do we construct programs to relocate or to adapt that assist those um, socially vulnerable communities. Uh, the, in in the best way possible, but also are sort of incentive compatible, as economists say, to for other types of uh, of populations. Because ultimately, considerations with about equity of treatment and things like that will also um, and political sort of necessities will also interfere in our decision making. And we need to consider all of these things when we are deciding our own policies or when we decide on, on, on regulations and laws that, that govern these uh, processes. And I think I will end here. Perfect, no, and, and I really like your last remarks because they really speak <laughs> to the need for a just transition. And we often talk about just transition on, on, like on the low carbon side, but also on the resilience side, we need to take into account, uh, I, I loved how you put it, no? Kind of the science systems, the human systems, and the political systems. Know, how, how do we manage them in the most optimal way, acknowledging that it will be suboptimal because we're, we're dealing with complex systems uh, as we've been discussing. So, and it really ties to the second round of questions, which is really more flexible. Um, it's a general round of, you know, you, you can respond to anything that uh, one of the other panelists said or, or simply reflect um, on the matter that, okay, so we have these examples that are starting to work on, on adaptation, these reflections, this upcoming science. Uh, what do you think, you know, are, are in your experience and your lessons learned in your career, 
what are the, uh, some concrete updates to policies, to regulations that are necessary to better enable us to, to rise to this challenge? And so I will go in order as, as, we, as we did the first round. So, Catherine. Thank you. Um, I've learned many lessons over, the, over my career. And, and I think the first one, and one of the most important one, is that climate adaptation is not a one-size-fits-all solution. We need to make sure we understand the, the, the region we're working on. We need to take into consideration the vulnerability of the countries we are trying to uh, uh, work with. And another lesson, that is also very important, is that when we think about climate adaptation, it's not only building infrastructure that will withstand extreme weather events. It is also about building economic resilience. It is also about building social resilience. And that means investing in education, investing in social welfare and investing in health care that will help people uh, cope better with climate change. So based on, the, on those lessons, I think there are four general updates that need to be made uh, in policies and regulations around the Caribbean. The first one is, of course, to mainstream climate adaptation in all levels of planning and decision making. And this is not the case. This is very, very rarely the case today. And this includes integrating climate adaptation into national development plans, um, sectoral policies, and also uh, very local land use um, planning. Secondly, I think we need to strengthen institutional coordination for climate adaptation. And this does not have to be super complicated. We can simply start with establishing very specific roles and responsibilities at different government agencies and different stakeholders that are involved in climate adaptation. Three, I think we need to increase access to climate finance, and we talked about this already, but I think Caribbean countries have to have access to adequate and affordable financing to implement their adaptation solutions. Um, and this can be done by mobilizing domestic resources, but also accessing international climate finance resources. And finally, I think we need to also promote public-private partnership, like we also talked about already. Um, I think the private sector can really play a very important role, not only to finance climate adaptation, but also to implement them. And we need governments to step up and create the um, enabling environment that will allow this type of partnership. So in, in, in addition to those um, general policies, of course, there are very specific policies and regulation that can be implemented. And, and I think it's going to be more obvious, like, for example, um, improving and implementing better building codes um, and other strategies that make sure that um, infrastructures are resilient to climate change. It will be investing in early warning system and other you know, disaster preparedness measures. It can also be, and this one is very close to my heart because this is where I started, um, protect and restore ecosystem that will provide natural protection to uh, climate impact like mangroves and, and coral reefs. And we also need to promote um, sustainable agriculture practices that will help farmers cope better with the, with the impact of climate change. And finally, um, we need also to invest in research and development. To go back to what was said before, we need scientists to work on solution strategies and um, provide us with the knowledge that we need to be able to implement better solutions. And I think that by taking those steps, um, Caribbean countries will be much better equipped to, be, um, um, to cope better with climate change. And I know we talked about this, but I also would like to finish by emphasizing the importance uh, of inclusion in all those different measures. Um, we need to um, up our game when it comes to equity and, and inclusion for climate ad adaptation, because the impact of climate change are very um, often um, 
felt much more acutely by the poor, the women, and the indigenous people. So we have to make sure that the policies and regulations that we implement are inclusive for all um, of the society. That's such an important message, and I, I know personally uh, a recent decision in Australia, you know, about precisely this, you know, bringing indigenous communities to hear every piece of legislation that is, you know, and being denied yeah. that access. Uh, it's incredible because going back to your first uh, uh, intervention, you know, we often find the dual pieces of knowledge and of understanding in indigenous and local yep. communities. And if we're not listening to them that know the ecosystems best, then we're making a, a huge mistake. Huh? So thank you so much for that. Um, I will turn now to Ricardo. What can you tell us, your, your biggest lessons learned about updates to, to policy? I think you touched upon it a lot in, in your intervention, but what can you leave us with? Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. I, I think listening to what has been said, um, we get some very concrete examples, and I did speak on roof series, but it would be remiss of me um, for not at this stage going a little bit off script and talking about some of the issues that are really confronting us. I happen to be fortunate enough to be one of the negotiators for the Alliance of Small Island States that covers the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the African SIDS, as well as the Caribbean. I also happen to be one of the technical advisors to the Transitional Committee on loss and damage for Latin America and the Caribbean. <clears throat> and there are some basics that we are facing right now. The reality is that adaptation has to be a country-driven, and in some instances, a region-driven, a community-driven, an individual focus if you are to succeed on adaptation, because you are only as strong as your weakest stakeholder, and that is the reality. But even more so, we are forced to adapt because globally we have failed to mitigate. And we have way too many partners who refuse to accept their responsibility through the Industrial Revolution in putting countries like those in the Caribbean region on the front lines of that climate crisis. Because our failure to mitigate has meant that we have even more to adapt to. Adaptation has therefore become less effective and more expensive, and loss and damage is the inevitable result. Those are the realities that face us daily when you live on the front lines of the climate crisis. Whether you are Mexico, as we learnt just over the last two days, whether you were the Caribbean, whether you were one of the Pacific SIDS, like Tuvalu, that was mentioned, it could be Palau, it could be Fiji, and the examples go on. We're facing both sudden onset and slow onset events that we have to be able to address. We need the assistance to do that. Many of the countries that we're talking about here, especially those in the Caribbean region, are considered middle-income countries and do not qualify for financing in concessional ways. It is part of why we have pursued the Bridgetown Initiative. And the Bridgetown Initiative is critical in our need to be able to rewrite the financial architecture that we are faced with today. That financial architecture was put in place at a time when the majority of the countries that we're talking about did not exist as sovereign states. And that is a critical thing. We can talk about adaptation, but if we do not have the ability to pay for it, then we are going to face crisis after crisis. Countries like Barbados, Antigua, the Bahamas, Trinidad, the list goes on. Many of those countries are willing to assist in financing their adaptation. But we need concessional rates. When you live in a world 
where some countries in Europe that are no more economically sound than we are, are borrowing money at 4% over 35 years with a 10-year moratorium. But I am looking at borrowing money at 12 or 14% repayable in 20 years. That's not a level playing field. And if we're going to adapt, we have to be honest with ourselves in that respect and make the moves in that regard, understanding that we all need to mitigate and we all need to adapt and we all face loss and damage, but some of us are on the front lines of the crisis and we are the accelerated mirrors of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, for... Can you hear me? Thank you for bringing these important topics to the table because we know they, they, will, they will be front and center in the next COP in Dubai. Uh, how do we rethink completely the system of, of climate finance? Um, so I will turn now to Mr. Ethan Sindler. Uh, please, can you share with us uh, some of the key lessons learned that, that you had and how the U.S. Treasury perhaps uh, is looking at addressing you know, the mounting needs of, of development finance for adaptation to climate? So, so first I say thank you for those, I mean, powerful comments um, and, and really appreciate them. And I would say that, um, and, and so many interesting uh, other an answers have been given to this question. So I'm going to try to um, not repeat them because I think it, you've made some great points as well. Um, you know, o overall, you know, obviously the Treasury is supportive of the process of, of of uh, MDB evolution um, and with, with the eye and the hope towards that it provides the availability, availability of more funding um, to address climate related issues. That is one of the goals overall of that initiative. Um, I would say, um, you know, maybe back to something Elon was mentioning, which is just this, this issue around gathering information and data. Um, and I think that um, as, as going back to sort of my first comment and, and, and the challenges around thinking about how you leverage private capital, um, I think Elon makes a very good point, which is that oftentimes people don't recognize the risks that climate uh, poses until after the disaster occurs. Um, or let's put it this way, th the risks are not made sort of blatantly obvious until after that occurs. And I think the point is now we, we have enough um, data and research where we can assess risks before these things happen and integrating that better into climate, uh, into, into policy making and assessing, um, you know, investment opportunities, I think is something that we'd definitely like to see more of overall. And I think that that's something that has not happened as much um, to date. So, but I would definitely endo endorse the views that, uh, that, that others have, have, and points others have made about this thinking about how you integrate um, thinking around resilience from top to bottom in your policy making, everything from building standards all the way to to top level long-term policy goals that are set that integrate thinking about resilience from the beginning, not as, a, as an afterthought. I love that. Um, well, I think that's a, a good way to, to go with our last uh, panelist, Dylan. Uh, can you share with us uh, your lessons learned that you want to, to share with the panel thinking about um, the, the tone of the, the conversation? Yes. Um, first of all, I want to wish Ricardo uh, much success in his um, participation in the um, uh, transitional um, loss and uh, loss and damage discussions. Uh, I, th I believe they are meeting again next week, and I hope that that meeting um, is fruitful because I think it's incredibly crucial that the loss and damage fund is going to be actually uh, up and, and running uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the, the, I, I want to sort of talk about two um, very long, what seems like low-hanging fruit, but something we haven't quite nailed down yet. I don't believe in, in any country. Um, one is I already mentioned that um, oftentimes people are all, only willing to talk about relocation uh, once a disaster hit. And in general, there is a realization that something is, has happened. Uh, so the risk has changed only once a disaster um, hit. Uh, but on the other hand, decisions post-disaster have this urgency in them, which makes them oftentimes suboptimal. So what we need to do is have decisions already 
done beforehand and, and processes set up and, and regulations set up and agreements and, um, and, and laws set up so that when a disaster hit, we can, we can make the right decisions. We can make the optimal decisions, for example, in this decision between adaptation and um, relocation. Um, so set up the legal structures that you need and set up the um, uh, all the procedural um, consultations and so forth um, beforehand so that what you you can you can hit the ground running if there is a, a disaster. That's surprisingly uh, something that no government as far as I know has implemented. Um, the other sort of very low hanging fruit seems to me is that when we are considering a new infrastructure, we need to be planning for a very long term. Um, and this is not just for the, 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 the lifetime of the, that piece of infrastructure, because if, for example, you build a seawall and you know the engineers say that seawall's life is 50 years, we don't only need to think about that 50 years because once that seawall is built, there will be a lot of assets built behind it that, so that we will, in a sense, be obligated to keep maintaining that um, seawall in, in perpetuity. So because the risk is changing, the profile is of risk is changing because of climate change, we need to do very long-term planning. Um, if it was fine to, to, to plan only 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ahead in a, in, a, in a world in which the risk is constant, that's no longer the case. So we need to really be thinking about the very long term when we are deciding on where to ro uh, locate infrastructure, where to locate roads, where to locate communities, and and so forth. And and that's a challenge because people, and especially uh, the political system, is not really set up to do this very long term uh, planning. So again, we need to set up systems in place so that those long term considerations uh, will be. Um, um, will be uh, considered when we are deciding on on, on many many issues around uh, development. I uh, agree, we'll and that. and and here uh, at the IDB we are beginning our efforts of Paris alignment in all of our operations, and and behind it is this concept of ensuring that there is long term planning behind, you know, the, the support that we give, and how we can enable that in our case in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean paying attention to the IPC's call for countries to go beyond their NDCs and also publish their long-term strategies, but thinking about you know, those long-term strategies actually being founded on sectoral policies, on uh, municipal plans that also have this long-term. And it's not just a shiny document that you know, is talking about what will happen in 2050 or 2060 without the stakeholder buy-in that we were talking about earlier, but actually that doing those, creating those long-term strategies is the process to kind of tackle this barrier that you're so adequately framing, you know, like the political system is not built for that, no? And, and so I think it will be very uh, interesting to see how the development uh, of these strategies uh, evolves into, into having more authentic and genuine long-term uh, commitments, no? Not only planning, but, but commitments to, uh, to adapt uh, not only our infrastructure, but also our social systems, as Catherine was pointing out. This is something that uh, we're very proud to be in, in, in doing in the, U, in, in, in the IDB as well, because our social sector, our labor sector, um, our e education, health, they're all really mainstreaming these things into the way we, we talk to countries, we talk to the ministries. No? Um, so I think you all touch about crucially important points, you know, the financial, the role of the financial system and how, um, you know, all the terms of, of loans and, and, and support are given. We need to, to address that. Um, IDB, for example, is, is now uh, piloting a new initiative called IDB Clima. Uh, we will we will be um, you know trying out this financial instrument where where basically we're giving a, a discounted rate for loans for uh, those countries that uh, are able to meet their NDC targets. Uh, so it's kind of a results based kind of approach to finance, but you know just a little small part of what is needed, I'm sure. Uh, but I think it's so important to to enable that environment. So for I think we have six minutes left. Um, so I just wanted to do like a rapid fire 
uh, you know, <laughs> just leave us with, with one final remark, like just harnessing the opportunity that we have so, such a wonderful panel here uh, that we're all, you know, so remarkable experts, you know. Uh, what do you think uh, institutions like MDB should be doing to harness all your potential and bring about, you know, th this change? So, like one minute each, okay? <laughs> so, thank you so much. Catherine. Well, I, I wanted to say that we do have a lot of the solutions for climate adaptation. This is, this is not a technological problem. What we need now is governments, private and public institutions to step up and to implement that. We have the solutions to combat it. We actually have the solution to stop climate change, right? Um, and, and I wanted to, rem to remind everybody that, that it is a, a political problem today and that political resources are renewable resources. So don't mm. forget to vote for people who are advocating climate solutions. Thank you. I think the, the IDB has been doing some wonderful work and it would be remiss of me not to mention the work that is being done right now on the climate finance platform um, for Latin America and the Caribbean having been involved. But the reality is that we need to reach more people with more inclusive type loans and grant arrangements that will take us further along the journey that we need. And we need to ensure um, that the IDB and the IDB's sister agencies that you work with take a view of the Paris Agreement and especially Article 2.1C of the Paris Agreement that understands that you are the development financing institution for Latin America and the Caribbean of number one choice and ensure that what you're looking at is a holistic view of finance flows and that you do not try to align every single project that you finance to net zero because then you will retard the overall development of the region. If countries demonstrate in their NDCs that they are aligned to net zero, we should not look at individual projects to seek to align every individual project to net zero. Because for example, if I have sea defenses to build, my sea defense project will not align to net zero when I have to look for high strength marine grade concrete mm -hmm. that's going to have a high rejection rate. So that's just one example. But we need to make sure that we're not leaving countries behind and we're being holistic in our sustainable development outlook. Thank you, Ricardo. <coughs> I'm yet to see an NDC that is aligned to net zero. I can show you, I can show you <laughs> at least three, okay. starting with yeah. ours. Okay, well, of course, we do have to preserve the forest, but decarbonization is an opportunity as well. I, so I will, we can take I this will, offline. I will encourage you to look at mine. <laughs> okay, wonderful. By 2035, net zero. Okay, Ethan. Uh, well, that's a really broad question, so I, don't, I definitely don't think I can give a sufficient answer in 60 seconds. But I certainly would just say that it is, just as a reminder, that it is within the context of the MDB reform um, that, that, uh, that the U.S. Treasury supports thinking more broadly about these climate issues and integrating them into decision making. Um, I'll say one last thing um, and just give a little plug for something that we uh, released uh, several weeks ago which is called the net zero principles. And this is looking back on the private sector again. Um, and this kind of builds off something that slightly, uh, that Elon was talking about, which is thinking about these long-term plans. We now have over 100 US financial institutions that have made some kind of long-term decarbonization goal. I think the number is something like over 600 globally. Um, and uh, we released this, um, these guidelines uh, about a month ago to, that specifically said that, that, that if you make a long-term decarbonization pledge, you should also have uh, a transition plan to get there. And the transition plan should have some immediacy to it. Um, and I think we've tried to emphasize that that is really important for financial institutions. Um, it, 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 that, that it's wonderful that people make big long-term headline grabbing goals. Mm -hmm. um, but, w but, um, but I think what we were very keen for, for there to be more of are specific, what am I gonna do tomorrow? What am I gonna do next week? Um, and a little, a little less about 2050. 
Yeah, the milestone, sorry. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, and Ilan, thank you for closing this panel. <laughs> yeah, um, I would start with, with Catherine's observation that this is not rocket science. Um, and actually, we know a lot of, in, in many cases, we know what the right choices are. And, and it's the political system that sometimes, and the legal system that sometimes is the, uh, is the stumbling block in, in many cases of, of adaptation. And I think, um, and this might be a bit controversial for, for an, you know, an intergovernmental organization like the um, IDB, um, but um, I think trying to think of how we can make sure that governments have the best tools um, to, to make the right decisions. And, and for example, in, in, in New Zealand, we tried to come up with a manager treat law and we realized that actually there isn't really a, a prototype here uh, anywhere in the world. And we need to sort of invent this from scratch, which turns out to be quite complicated because there are so many moving parts to that kind of a, a, a managed retreat or managed relocation law. Um, so assisting governments to make sure that they really have this on a, on a sort of on a, on a silver platter is is potentially a, a something that could be overcome this this issue of of um, political um, obstructionism maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would be would be a polite um, way to say it. Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, I think it's very accurate, and uh, I thank you, Ilan, for closing on this important note of the role of knowledge. Uh, and effective knowledge. And I think our next panel about data visualization is addressing just that, you know, how important it is to be, you know, very assertive with the knowledge that we are creating. So I'm excited to see that, uh, but not before thanking our stellar panelists that joined me today. Thank you so much for your contributions to this ongoing conversation. And thank you all uh, here at Washington DC that you joined us in person and everyone online. Uh, I think we're right on, on point, so um, just wanted to, to do a little commercial. In our 2024 development in the Americas flagship report on climate, we will be presenting cutting edge uh, research and, and proposed policy solutions on this uh, important uh, topic. So I encourage you all to, to read that uh, as well. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sophia, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And guys, come here for a picture. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. <clears throat> Ricardo. Ladies and gentlemen, a sincere thank you to our esteemed Just panel, of course, <laughs> for sharing their invaluable insights on climate change adaptation. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Your expertise is crucial to navigate, thank you very much, to navigate the evolving climate landscape and ensure a prosperous future for all. Now, it's time to take a short break Light launch, 30 minutes. I'll see you here at 12.30. Thank you very much.
we're back. We're back here. Online and, of course, in person. Thank you for, be for being so generous with your time. Um, we have had many people, many people connected through all our sessions. I think the number is immense. The number is like 14. Oh, what? 40,000? Wow. Okay. So, hello. <laughs> Now, let's shift our focus uh, to data uh, visualization on climate change triggers for action. This session will shed light on how effective data representation can inspire meaningful action in the fight against climate change. Leading this discussion, we have a distinguished panel of experts who excel in translating complex climate data into compelling visual narratives. Joining us today, we have Jean Artus Bertrand, environmentalist, activist, journalist, and photographer. James Cheshire, professor of geographic information and cartography at the University College of London. Brenda Lopez Silva, lead scientific programmer at NASA. Earth Information Center, Maite Siriaco Ruiz, journalist at the Data Journalism Unit. El Comercio, and Jerome Wood, sustainability and environmental management professional at the Coastal Zone Management Unit. Moderating this exciting panel, let us welcome Jennifer Doherty Vigara, Senior Climate Change Specialist at the IWB. Let's welcome them with an applause. Thank you very much, uh, and please uh, welcome everyone here in person, but also everyone online. I'd like to start uh, this panel sharing that uh, I felt left out, so I did my own slides too. Uh, but I had to steal uh, some visualization tools that I didn't do myself, but some of you might recall these stripes. Uh, and I hope you do know what they mean, uh, because the whole point about this panel is that in one shot, we can understand what is being said to us. So sadly, this is how global warming could be put in one single image. And if we go into a bit more detail, this is what it actually means, which is um, the average, average temperature over the reference period of 1971 to 2000. So when uh, these stripes were shown, everyone was asked with a hashtag to show their stripes. So this is what we want to convey today. When we are trying to put in a single tool, image, whatever it is, and we'll talk about different ways to do it, we want actually to let people know about climate change because it's still very much an idea out there. But what is it in fact and how can that also trigger action? Because we don't want to scare anyone. We want everyone to be part of this story. So please welcome my panelists. They will be talking about this in a technical way. Uh, I'll try to bring it also back to some more uh, general uh, narrative. But uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. And uh, well, we'll start with you, James. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, James, uh, you're, a professor, you're a professor of uh, geographic information and cartography at the University College on, in London. Uh, but first of all, James, uh, your expertise in geographic information systems, a field that plays a crucial role in environmental and climate research, has proven to be fundamental. Your innovative data visualization techniques often involves creating visually appealing and informative maps. What are some effective strategies for making climate data visualizations accessible and understandable to everyone? And I'll give you the... Great, thank you. And thanks for the, 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 the question. So, um, in, in my particular case, um, I guess I come from a place where... Um, just one second, I'm just going back through the slides, just so we're back at the beginning where I need to be. Great, so um, I come from a place where I'm a, an academic and I'm interested in uh, researching data as well as working out ways of visualizing it. But I'm also quite lucky, I suppose, in a sense, because I'm not a pure climate scientist. And so what that means is I can um, you know, push the boundaries a little bit further, perhaps, in terms of the way that I visualize the data, because I'm not perhaps so accountable in a way that like a pure climate scientist may be. And, and, and it also enables me to be a bit more creative. So um, I, uh, a few, 
a couple of years ago, I published a book with, my, with a, a co-author who's a designer. The book was called Atlas of the Invisible. And a lot of what we put in there was about visualizing climate. And I'm just going to show you one of the examples of how we go from uh, kind of what might be fairly academic data to something that actually m means something to people. And I think this is quite a nice example that, you know, doesn't apply to uh, everyone uh, here working necessarily kind of working outside of uh, visual journalism, that kind of thing. But it is a good way of thinking through um, how you might convey the message that you're trying to tell. So up on the screen is a, a, a map of the island of uh, Majuro, which is part of the Marshall Islands. And this is a, a figure that appeared in an academic publication by some authors from the US Geological Survey. And you can see here that it's kind of showing the, the part of the atoll, and it looks fairly technical. And, and the story here is about sea level rise and how uh, that's going to impact this tiny strip of land. We wanted to show it in a more compelling way. But the problem is, it's really tiny. So um, uh, the blue on the left is the, the full sort of Marshall Islands, uh, the full extent of them. Uh, the the right-hand side is kind of just that strip of Maduro. And so if you're trying to show that story on a slide or in a book or something like that, it's very hard to do. But you can think about it kind of editorially, and you can start thinking, well, what other information can we bring in to, to help contextualize this? So we could perhaps put a map of the world up to show where the sea levels are rising everywhere else. And we can try and zoom in as much as we can on this particular atoll. In the end, we zoomed in even further. So actually, this is a tiny strip of land. It's only telling a tiny part of the story in terms of the overall data. But it's relatable, because it's talking about the capital. And it's talking about how that sea level rise is in, the, the global level is then impacting at a real local level. And so there's a bit of abstraction going on here from the beginning of that very technical story to the one that you see on the screen here. And then this was actually picked up by the New York Times, and they did a whole series of sort of postcards from Warming Planet. And they went one step even further, and this is kind of a mobile version of that map, where they zoomed in even more just to one tiny part of a tiny island where they were able to talk about the impacts on the people living there. And so it became less about the data and more about the impacts that the data are trying to show. And so I think this is a nice example of really thinking about your message and then actually not worrying about the, everything you have in terms of your data or the story, but actually pulling out the key part of it, because that's the bit that will resonate, and that's the thing that people will find most compelling, I think, when you're trying to communicate some of the impacts of this. So I'll hand back to you. Thank you, James. And I think that what we want to tell here is that we have to own the narrative at different levels. Uh, I think we can say that here, I, I can't be considered a climate change purist, but sometimes I can talk about the Paris Agreement in a way that will make people feel lost. Uh, I can start talking about articles and things like that, and we don't want that. We want actually to, to make the narrative approachable. And you were also mentioning how we need to make it relatable. And this is why uh, I would look back to Maite. Sorry, I'll be going between English and Spanish, so uh, please bear that in mind. Uh, Maite. Maite. Um, something of what James said, especially the human stories behind these images. So I'd like to hear your story, because we've invited you, because we'd like to know what led you to develop a career in journalism, at the data journalism, because you're a journalist in Peru. Tell us a little bit of what happened. What was that first dream of yours where you said, I need to tell these stories so that they're understood? And so that behind the story of climate change, we know that there are people. Gracias. Yes. In 2017, I began to work on a project called Aguatenientes. It was a transnational a journalistic project with Colombia and Peru. And in Peru, we had to investigate the lack of water in a region called Ica. In fact, Ica is almost a desert. But the large agro-exporting companies are found there, paradoxically. It's called, it's the famous agro-exporting miracle because that's where the products are exported from. So I began to investigate, and the first thing I found was this image. The image of a underground well in the midst of a desert in a district called Villacuri. Villacuri is a place where people 
have no water. Water comes every 15 days and only for about two hours. So my question, and I had many at the time, was why? Why are they building water underground wells in a place where there is no water, where people like this man who had a harvest had to leave because his land was like this, completely dry, and they had nothing to live from. So the government realizes what was happening. They realized the tremendous impact of the climate change, or are they simply not realizing what was going on? So I investigated a little with my team, and we found a study from 2014 talking about the fact that Villa Curi, that place, that very year, 2017, was going to end up without any water, that not even every 15 days were they going to get the water. So what were we talking about? What was happening? And I also found that the National Water Authority that allows the permits to build the wells had a tremendous database of all the wells that there were in the whole country. So I started exploring, and I found that they'd done the study with this database, but only in Villacuri, and that they'd done it based on the density of the exploited water and the number of wells in Villacuri. And I thought, why? Why can't we do the same nationally? And then we'd be able to know whether if there are other Villacuris in Peru or other districts in Peru that have no water as well, and other people like this man and his sisters that I showed a minute ago who have absolutely no water, who see the impact of the climate change. And if we had that information in a more accessible way than what we had at the time and what the National Water Authority had, people and experts could make better decisions, better than what was being done that far. Uh, like the poor decision was to allow the construction of water wells to companies in Villacuri who had exploited the water use much more when the water levels were very low. So what we did well, three things. We understood three things. First, no, we weren't realizing in Peru that climate change existed, that it was a real thing, and that, in fact, it already had had an impact. In Ica, there was no water. I mean, there were districts without water. Second, if we joined experts, we'd be able to use the data and build a map of all the water wells in Peru in the critical areas to see who was getting the water permits or who were the ones who were building even clandestine wells that we found. And third, that if just one image, one single well had uh, moved me, had made me investigate and, and realize that the climate change was a real thing and that my country had areas that had no water ever since 2014 and we were in 2017 and nothing was being done, what would happen if we created something like this? A map with all the water wells where anyone could go in and see water use, uh, water levels, places where we were dry without any type of public policy. And we recognize the impact of big data, but also the impact of visualizing it and, and humanizing it, telling the stories behind the data. Thank you, Maite. In fact, when we speak of information, often it's one of the big challenges of the climate change agenda. We have the information. Can we put it from paper to more digital? And also, you spoke of the experts. 
And of course, when we speak of exports, we may be talking about you, Brenda, because you come from NASA. When we think about the experts, don't we all kind of think about, you know, like NASA must be somewhere there. So that's why we, we have you here and we welcome you because uh, NASA has developed online platforms uh, and tools for accessing climate related data, including visualization tools that allow to interact with that specific data. And there's way too much data. So that's why uh, we would like to know about what's the role that uh, these evolving tools have and how they can shape public perception, but even make better public policy. Thank you, and thanks for sharing your stories. They're uh, very uh, nice to hear. And uh, yes, yeah, so NASA basically has been always thought as like we are looking outside and you know like getting into space, and basically Earth is not the priority. But since uh, 60 years ago, like NASA has been looking at at the Earth, and it's like off the Earth to the Earth. Basically, the idea is to collect data about the Earth. There are many sensors uh, outside right now collecting data of different kinds, different satellites also that are geostationary, which are basically just looking at specific, spar specific parts of Earth and uh, other orbiting satellites, different uh, levels of data and not only satellite data. So the idea is that all of this data, which is massive, how is this uh, getting processed? So there are more than thousands of uh, scientists I am lucky to work with uh, all these very smart people and learn from them. Uh, the idea is that all of this data is uh, it's massive. And uh, some of these techniques are, uh, well, the idea is that we try to develop technologies to put this into different, not only visualizations, because visualization is like, how do we interpret this? Working with different uh, scientists and trying to understand what data is telling us. Uh, the other th things are like, uh, how real, how uh, accurate, more, mostly how real time is this information? So those are some of the challenges. And how can we process all these massive amounts of data? So we don't only do observations, we also do um, specific um, simulations. So what you are looking, I just put a series of visualizations that are looping through so you can see at different ways of looking at this information. These are the stripes that uh, Jennifer introduced. And uh, you will see how that also changes. Uh, it's different ways of looking at those climate stripes. So this is like the vertical view of those and how climate is changing ac across time. So the idea is that we are trying to put this uh, complex information in different ways that people can access. And the main idea is for NASA is that all, the, all of this is available and open to the public. Uh, it has we have the data uh, that we can share as visualizations, but we have also the raw data that people can look and uh, take with them and try to understand, make sense out of that. So those are and some of the main challenges. The idea is also to put this uh, complex information into different ways that uh, not only the general public, but decision makers and scientists and students or professors can take with them and try to understand and interpret based on their uh, specific needs. Thank you, Brenda. And yes, it's important because we just don't want to develop data for just the sake of developing it. And that's why I'd like to turn uh, to Jerome. Thank you for being here. Um, last year, uh, Barbados uh, had a debt for a nature uh, transaction. And as part of it, uh, marine spatial planning was uh, decided as a main milestone. So. Um, we are supporting uh, the, the government with their marine spatial planning process, and we understand that this needs to be based on science, on information. So could you share with us how this information helps stakeholders understand what's happening, what it is that the government would like to do, and that this information has to be translated to every different kind of profile of the different stakeholders that need to be feeling empowered about this. So please, could you share that process with us today? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here and share this, share this scenario with everyone about the data visualization journey that we're going on in Barbados. So it's the application of a lot of what my colleagues here have spoken about and how it could really be incorporated into a resource management, a risk management, and a sustainable development challenge for Barbados. So, 
When you think about Barbados, you think about that beautiful place, nice, pretty, white, sandy beaches, maybe go and take a dip, enjoy yourself. Um, but this is about the data that supports that. Most of the time, you come, you see the coastal area, you see the boats going up and down, you see activities occurring, but you don't think about the complexity of that management situation. So if you look on the right side of the screen, that is the data environment that we're dealing with. Lots of different variables, uh, different spatial and temporal skills that need to be incorporated into a management and decision-making process that meets all the needs of the different stakeholder groups. So that enters the data visualization conversation that we're getting into for the marine spatial plan. So just a little bit of context. All of that confusion that you would have just seen with the many different variables, the lots of different activities that are occurring, that's all in the near shore area. However, Barbados is a large ocean country. When you look at it, you see the difference between our marine territory and our terrestrial territory. There's a vast difference. However, we've done a lot of work on ensuring how we manage and deal with that near shore area. Lots of work, decades of work, the Coastal Zone Management Unit have been working on it. Not that they have been ignoring the wider EEZ, but when we look at the sort of management decisions that have been made and the work that has been done, we see that when we look at our debt for nature swap agreement, that is just a drop in the bucket. And now for this marine spatial planning exercise, we're going to go on working on methodologies for managing the wider EEZ. So I can run you through some of these different layers and variables pretty quickly. For the management conversation that we're having, we're looking at the biophysical. Information like mapping the benthic habitat, using satellite altimetry, ground truthing on the ground with the University of the West Indies. We got a pretty comprehensive understanding of what the benthos of Barbados looks like. But on top of that, why does it matter if we know where these things are? We need to understand how they stand. That enters the reef, reef health index for Barbados. The dives all around the country, we have an understanding of where the reefs are healthy, where they're not. But we started with the pretty picture of the white sandy beach. All of this happens within the tourism context. What's the importance of that coral reef to this multi-million dollar industry in the Barbadian context. There's a way to visualize it. Everybody that sees it, some people will see the dollars and cents of the tourism industry, but what does that mean in relation to the coral reefs? What does that mean spatially? There are some areas that are more important if you're looking at it from an economic agenda than others. However, when we look at that from a social standpoint, we see that population, and economic productivity, when you put them side by side, we start to identify some trends. The areas that may be the most financially valuable may not be the highest populated areas. What does that mean from a social development, uh, opportunities, a resilience conversation for Barbados's economy and society? Put that all together, we then have to consider the economy, society, ecology context of this marine spatial planning and coastal area management conversation. This is where we put all the data together in order to deal with some management. However, when we look at the broader EEZ, we see that there's lots of activity. This is maritime transport. We're looking at how we can incorporate that into our marine spatial planning needs. Fisheries, another very important stakeholder that have, has not been mentioned as yet, but we put their needs, their agendas, their risks and requirements in that marine spatial planning conversation, we can start to identify trends, hot spots, different spatial temporal needs for the fisheries sector. All these things need to be incorporated, and that doesn't even touch on the energy sector. Looking at the bid blocks for the energy sector within the wider EEZ. So as we move from that 
very active, very complex in your shore zone, and we move further out, we start to see that there are different stakeholders with different needs. And this data visualization exercise is one where we're trying to ensure that people can interface with the information in a way that may be more easily understandable, more easily accessible, so that we can use this methodology to go into conversations with these different stakeholder groups. So you can tell me what you need. Show me the areas that are most important to you. Show me where there are conflicts, where there are challenges, and we can have those cross-pollinations between stakeholder groups in order to push this conversation forward. And that is the journey of the Marine Spatial Planning Data Visualization and Data Collection Exercise in Barbados. Thank you, Drew. And uh, as you can see, I was very happy. Everyone's taking pictures. So uh, I think one of the objectives, my indicators of success was like, yeah, if they're taking pictures, the visualization tools are great. So. <laughs> Thank you, Jerome, because you brought it to a specific context, just as also Maite was doing it. And it's amazing to see the reaction of people. And most importantly, as you were mentioning, we're going to start some public consultations. And there are a lot of incentives, a lot of that data is also very much related in different ways, different levels to different people. So it's all how they will understand or not some of the messages. And that's also the, the beauty of it, complexity. And that's when I'll, I'll go back to you, James. Sorry. And uh, complexity, as we were looking at the different slides of Jerome, is kind of also how we want these tools to make things easy. I'm not saying that it's uh, simplistic, uh, but it's important that when we talk about climate data, it often involves complex scientific information. And we were saying we, we do not consider ourselves uh, these scientists, uh, but we want to ensure that we balance um, accuracy and simplicity. So how are you, you know, working with that challenge and making sure that you are providing as much information as you can, but also not getting lost in that amount of information? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, mean I think we've, as we've seen just from the slides just now, there's no shortage of data, actually. I mean, there's huge quantities of data available. And it's being collected all the time in near real time by people like Brenda in, in NASA. The real challenge is around the interpretation of that data and actually having people that can look at it all and, and actually digest it and then tell you something about it that makes it relevant and interesting uh, to you or your stakeholders in order for them to make decisions based on, on this. And I think there's been a few really exciting, um, I suppose, developments really in the last decade or so, something that I've experienced. And the biggest of these is really how data has become um, mainstream in the way that people are able to access it. So it used to be that someone like NASA put out a data set showing, um, I don't know, it could be a live data set showing the path of a, a hurricane or a tropical storm. That data used, it would then take several days to be processed. You may find NASA present an image of that at some point, and it's for policymakers or for the general public to look at it and understand what's going on. Now, that data can be plumbed straight in to the front pages of all the major newspapers. And so I say to my students, if you want to uh, see what the latest and the best data visualization is. Go on the Washington Post or the New York Times or any other of the major newspapers during a major event such as a hurricane, and you will see this thing in, in real time moving across the, the front page. And the image would look like any other that you would see. It wouldn't be technical or it wouldn't be overly complex or anything like that. And so I think that kind of is, is really good news because it means that you know you kind of have that data pipeline from you know, Brenda on the right and Mater on, on, the, on the left here, where you can actually get that data and, and actually people within newsrooms can do some really serious data analysis, which then enables things like advocacy. And that's another really important aspect to this. And so that, again, is something that actually uh, things like maps and visualizations have been used for for a very long time. You know, actually one of the most successful cartographic campaigns was, was run by um, women uh, to secure their rights to vote. And if you look up the women's suffrage movement, you can see they use maps, they use data all the time to leverage change, to, to say to policymakers, this is unacceptable. And it, they even use the phrase, the map proves it. You know, this is unacceptable, the map 
you know, the, the map proves it. And so if you're in a position where you're able to create that visualization and you've got the people who can tailor it to your audience, then that is incredibly powerful. And I think that is the other key point here. It does have to be tailored to the audience. You know, what people care about in Barbados is going to be different, perhaps, to what people care about even on an adjoining island or elsewhere in the Caribbean. And, and I think what we saw in those slides was really a nice example of how, you know, the slide where you have the dollars and the number of people and the benthic floor and fauna and all that kind of stuff, you're actually talking to several different audiences there who are clearly major stakeholders. So I think that that's, that's a really important aspect. And, the, and the, the final thing I think I would say on this is that um, uh, simplicity is, is, not, is not dumbing down the information, right? As I showed in my examples, it's actually distilling a clear message. And one of my frustrations with academics like like me sometimes, is you say to colleagues, well, I'd like to create, I do this visualization or I show them something I've done in one of my books. They go, ah, oh, it's too, too simple. You've dumbed that down too much. And that's not, that completely misses the point. You know, the data and everything that underpins it is robust and solid and true. All we've done is we've spent the time tailoring it to the people who are going to consume that, that, that data and information and then be able to do something with it. And I think that's really important. And that's also to say that it doesn't have to be kind of stunning in the way that, it's visual, in the way that it visually appeals to people. It just has to resonate with your audience, whether that's 10 people in a meeting room or tens of thousands of people, you know, that you're trying to uh, communicate the message to. So, you know, I think it's a really exciting moment because I think that everything, like all these data sets, are now really mainstream. They're accessible. Um, but the, uh, and they're inspiring, but it's really just getting the people in the room now to start digesting it and, and tailoring it to the people who then will use that for their decision making. Thank you, James. Uh, I think that what we're saying right now is like, you've become the new storytellers. You are storytelling. And to do that right, you need to understand your audience and you also need to understand what, are, what is the data you've decided to translate it. Uh, and I do appreciate when, when you really very much underline that you're not dumbing it. And that's also something we need to be careful with because as we know nowadays uh, with populism kind of popping over, trying to make it everything about simplicity, uh, that's an important thing to take back when we think about how these tools are just trying to translate it to everyone but not making it uh, like a cheap version of what they're kind of based on. And that's why I'd like to go back to Maite. Maite, uh, you're a storyteller. Story teller. So, um, es importante recordar que... So, as a journalist, it's important to remember that you're trying to convey a story of something that moved you and will move others. A lot of what you said showed that there is data. And when we talk about climate change, very often we talk about experts, how sometimes the intergovernmental expert group, the IPCC, has published a few reports, not all of us have read all of them, right? They're made up of a lot of pages. So what is the role of journalists, do you think? When you see those reports, how do you translate them so that each person can understand them in their own way? Another way to talk about it is to say, hey, look at what's happening. There are stories of catastrophes, what just happened in Acapulco. And many people say, well, but we already knew that. We've been saying that this might happen. We want the audience, society, to be able to prepare, but also politicians need to have the ability to use that information, translate into translated into active and impactful public policies. How can that be done from your perspective? How can we achieve that? Well, the most important thing is to connect. And here, I'm going to give you some data. In March 2023, in Peru, we had 65 deaths due to the Jaku hurricane, five missing persons, and 11,000 uh, victims of damage. Just one month later, in April, we had 99 deaths, 
13 missing people and over 65,000 who had suffered damages. And I could continue giving you the numbers, the statistics, and these have been growing as time goes by. It's not working. Sorry about that. And I could present that data in a bar graph or as a map, or I could show you linear maps or interactive uh, graphs. There are so many different kinds of graphs. What about the people, though? Where do those stories that are behind all these numbers, where do those stories go? Because each number is a story somebody's story. My partner, Wendy Vega, what she says is that every time there's a crisis or there's a catastrophe, each victim becomes a number. They get codified as a number. But what happens if we forget this aspect of the numbers of codification, we start to decipher. To do that, we need two things. We need to connect, and we do that by looking at climate change as a horizontal mainstream topic, something where there are a lot of victims, but what are they victims of? Well, this is related to education, access to education, access to health, access to, for example, teenage pregnancy uh, prevention or gender violence prevention, but we never close that circle. We should. For example, we're looking here at uh, a community from Monte Verde in the northern part of Peru. Everything is far away from them where they live. Education, or I mean schools and health centers are a minimum of an hour's walk away or 45 minutes by donkey. There's no public transportation that reaches this place and a taxi would uh, be unaffordable for them. The market is also an hour away and so on. All basic services are an hour away. But when the cyclone, when the hurricane came in, everything was two or three hours away swimming because they had to swim there because they ended up completely isolated. And this woman, for example, This woman has five children. Uh, she's expecting her sixth. She got pregnant in the middle of the emergency because she had no access to birth control. And she's codified because for the state, she is a statistic. She's a code. And actually, that's what the Peruvian state does. But what if we decipher? What if we look into it and tell her story? So, And we have new visualization formats. Yes, we use technology, but we have to include the people, their lives. Like these video games, these interactive uh, games for uh, journalism, it's not the same for me to say to you. The Peruvian government has created over 90 uh, standards and guidelines that can help us address the issue of uh, preventing teenage pregnancies. It's not the same to do that as it is to have this game where it was actually a teenager, a 15-year-old who did the graphic work here and who understands prevention, but was expressing it how somebody that age would expressing it. It shows these uh, guidelines, but it says also there are these issues, these problems, and those are the problems that you have to deal with in the game. It's not the same for me to say, what is the number of people who have died in the Peruvian Amazon due to a lack of prevention services or protection from, uh, from flooding? It's not the same to have that as to have a group of uh, teenagers from the Amazon to put on this play showing what they've been through, giving the numbers, but also showing what they've been through. This is performative journalism, as we call it. So different ways of visualizing the information with a human side to it all the time. I think that's the way to do it, by connecting. Thank you very much. I think that 
word connection is important. Also looking at the differences between the tools we have, the number of tools, theater, all the way to what Brenda was showing us. And so I come back to you, Brenda. These amazing visualization tools can be owned by anyone. How can you make sure that uh, through NASA that you're creating like a mission control environment? How can we ensure that there is an education process behind this? Because once again, what we've seen and part of the, the climate change agenda challenge has been that we've been unable to tell the story. So how are you working on this and how can you make sure that people like Maite can have this information and translate it into specific stories, specific people behind them. Thank you. Uh, well, there's a big effort for NASA. Like I mentioned earlier, we, it's not about like collecting data. It's also trying to make sure that people are aware of what's happening and how can we take action and basically become autonomous and decision makers individually and collectively. We have recently opened an Earth Information Center in June, and I'm not promoting, it's, basic, the, it's brand new, it's just open, it's in NASA headquarters, like 20 minute walk from here. And it's, we are trying to promote exactly this kind of data as a mission control point of view. By that, what, what do we mean with that, right? Like, we are a, putting all this information available because it's a NASA's effort and NASA's intention to make sure that everyone sees what's happening. We are not going to tell you what to do, but the, the idea of knowledge and information is what helps everyone take decisions. And how can we make better decisions without much information? So we're trying to put this information available to the public in this physical space, but that doesn't limit, it's not only limited to that uh, point of view, right? So we have different uh, websites and different uh, efforts that are trying to convey and put also the data for everyone to access and also tools, because it's not only about the data. It's how do, you, how do we use the data? And if, if, you don't have, if you're not an expert, then how can we include you to be part of that decision making and understanding of the data? So recently, NASA also is making efforts in a new uh, site called Environmental Justice. And what we're trying to do with that is a collection of many um, data sets organized and, uh, into different um, structures which are related to air quality or climate change, disasters, and so on where you can go into this place and also start looking at something that affects you directly. The idea of this is that you can come and find the tools, not only the data. So you can look at different tools, it's a large collection, but I can see what happened yesterday in Acapulco or in any different specific regions and do comparisons. For me it was really amazing when you said, like, yeah, Barbados is very hot and the electricity goes down. You can go and look in this, with these tools, you can go and what's before and after electricity yesterday or today, like the most up-to-date information to see these kind of changes that are happening right now. So the main uh, challenges that we are encountering right now is basically how can we make sure that all of this data is um, available to the public we get it and we try to put it as soon as possible to it, so everyone can access that. As, like I, I mentioned also, like we don't do only like observations, we also do modeling and trying to do some sort of predictions and that is mapped with, a, a, with the data that we get and receive and it's processed to large uh, supercomputers and then that data processing is like we assimilate that data, right? So it's like what is in between the model and the real data, so we can, this is data simulation. So you can see what's uh, up to date also, like we are looking at information that is very uh, actual, uh, updated and providing the tools to, for everyone to be able to access that. So one of the things that I also wanted to share is about the idea of storytelling, right? Because we can uh, put all this data into the general public, but how can we tell these stories? And one of the most amazing things that I have experienced by working at NASA is talking to astronauts. 
and their impression about going to space. So for me, it's like amazing with t talking to them, and it's the this, this similar story that I hear from them. It's like, when you go out to space and look at the Earth, the only thing that really keeps you together, first of all, it looks, we all, f they feel very vulnerable, because they, you can see that there's only this like, little layer of atmosphere protecting us, and the size of this uh, planet, look, looking from the outside, is so small, but it gives them such a sense of belonging. And the idea that we all share this planet and try to make something together to keep it alive, it's very strong to me. Well, you just started storytelling, something that I saw some eyes like, we're not going to cry, we're not vulnerable. <laughs> um, I know we're all trying to get better at that. Um, but talking about vulnerability, uh, and also, I'm pretty sure that here Jerome is looking at all that data and the fact that you keep on saying that it's accessible. So I'm pretty sure he's going to take your data and be like, okay, can you share some on Barbados? Because what we've seen in Barbados is that that data collection has been complicated. And uh, yes, you showed uh, an amount of data that you were able to identify, but we're still missing quite an amount of it. So as you continue building uh, upon those data sets, we also would like to know, as a Caribbean island, a small uh, island developing state, it is important that we attain that 30%, um, because it is a commitment um, for biodiversity, a commitment made by the country, but it needs to be done well. So what would you say is um, a specific ingredient or many ingredients that you would require and beyond having a specific ask for NASA here and, and, and Brenda, I'm pretty sure you're going to get a list, but what can we do better to help you attain those targets? Thanks a lot for that question. That is, that is a very important question because of where we are. If you have any idea of the marine spatial planning process with all the territories that have gone through it around the globe, it takes time, it takes energy, takes lots of people, takes lots of resources, and the data requirements are gargantuan. And I could bring out a list of a million things that we do need, but I think a better way of going about this request is more so saying what the data sets are required for, why they are so important, and how they can help us as a nation in this MSP process. Then I'll follow up with the list. But just so you can get an idea of what is needed, the data sets that we have in the near shore, yes, they are valuable, but we need data sets that are targeted, prioritized based on what the immediate needs are, specifically because Data sets are data sets. You could tell any story once you're a skilled statistician and geostatistical modeling, as you would know, you could tell many stories with any data set. Because of that, we need to ensure that the data sets that are collected are specific to what we need them for. We know that for this depth for nature swap, we need to prioritize areas that are high biodiversity zones. We know what is in our near shore area, but the wider EEZ is a big question mark. First things that we want to go after, get an understanding of what is there in terms of habitats, biodiversity, these ecologically important zones, that's one of the priority areas. But aside from just prioritizing based on your strategic needs for the activity, we also need the information to be representative and focused. These data sets are the expressions of individuals. So this participatory mapping exercise that will tell us where all of these activities are occurring and where the challenges exist and why when this piece of the reef is affected, it impacts families, livelihoods, communities, in real ways. This is the difference between me being able to feed my family, me being able to stop storm surge from affecting my house, that may be a little bit too close to the coastline. 
these are the things that are going to be very important in a participatory mapping exercise. And we're going to embark on that. However, that's a big task. Lots of people, lots of conversations, and since it needs to be representative, we need to ensure that we capture as many stakeholders in the process as is humanly possible. And there are many different tools for doing that. Some people will come and we'll sit in a room and we'll do our 3D modeling and we'll put things together. However, we need tools so that we could send out digital surveys, that we could do remote um, conversations with different stakeholder groups, that we can get to the older um, associates in our communities that may not log on to the websites, they may not come out to the meetings, but they have valuable information that can teach us the lessons from the past so that we can build a better future. So that's the second thing we need, supporting capturing these participatory mapping components from different stakeholders in Barbados. The other thing, we need it to be as all-encompassing as possible. Big data. Big data ain't cheap. It's not cheap by any <laughs> stretch of the imagination. We need to find ways to, remo to do remote and autonomous data collection. Barbados, we have a few people. Even fewer high-skilled, competent data collectors. If we're able to use technology to fill some of these data gaps, we can push this way, way, way further and way faster. And this is one of the major requests that we will have for the MSP going forward. And once it's representative, it's focused, it's targeted, it's telling the stories of what is needed by the different stakeholder groups, then we need to ensure that after that beautiful story is told, it is a play to make the relevant decisions that are necessary. And these decisions are resilience building, sustainable development, living a better life decisions. As a result, we want to know what softwares, what programs, what methodologies can be used to make these decisions in a way that they are not necessarily biased by agendas of different stakeholder groups. There are different tools, there are different techniques. We want to get some outputs, and we'll do that over the next few months, but we'll get outputs to have some conversations about what these management decisions need to be. And this is just the start. This is going to be a long journey for this marine spatial planning process, and there'll be many outputs, but it's an exercise that we need to engage in for the sustainable management of our resources and building resilience for Barbados and other small land development states in the region. Thank you, Jerome. And uh, it's impressive how we were able to get different stories, uh, different storytellers around the table. And I think you got a question from the audience. Uh, I'll go a bit off script because we have the opportunity to have an answer from you straightforward. So. Uh, if the person who shared the question with us could come forward and share the question for Jerome, we would happily let him give an answer. Oh, person is no longer here, but uh, Jerome, I guess you, you gave really a, a good answer in your last uh, slide. So thank you very much, everyone. I think you could see how visualization tools can go from NASA to maps. Uh, but also how journalists are doing their best to do their own visualization tools. But as we all got inspired in different ways, uh, we wanted to inspire you one more time today. So with our conclusion, we will actually share with you uh, some final remarks that were shared uh, by Yann Arthus Bertrand. Some of you may know him. Uh, this photographer uh, was the one that captured that island that had a heart shape and keeps on doing movies that want to kind of create that connection that Maite was talking about. Uh, you may have seen some of them, human, uh, but the latest one is called Legacy. And we want to share with you uh, his words that I hope will give us that inspirational kind of message we all want, because all of this is to have an impact, to create, uh, to ensure that there is climate action. So please uh, allow me to listen to this message with you, but also just share with you that uh, the IDB will be sharing a legacy with you all in a couple of weeks, and uh, we hope that you will enjoy it and that the movie will make you feel, I guess, vulnerable, but uh, most importantly, I think it will allow you to understand that you have a place in this agenda 
and that climate change can be daunting, but we very much want you to be part of the next steps. So thank you very much, everyone, and please, uh, let's follow up with the message. Bonjour, et merci beaucoup, du fond du cœur. Oh, and thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. This is one of my favorite films. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sting to have been uh, the English voiceover with uh, so much spontaneity. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. This film uh, is a personal story. It's my fascination with uh, life on Earth. It's an invitation to look at the world with open eyes, thanks uh, to uh, the, the scientific um, data. Scientists' data, you'll understand that my hope resides in this infinite hope that we should all share for life around us. That is why, I, very simply and humbly, I'd like to say that I love you. Thank you very much. The majority of its history, it could have been called Planet C. For a very long time, this life in the oceans was limited to tiny, simple organisms the equivalent of today's plankton. I like this comparison. If the history of life on Earth until today is represented as a 24-hour period, and it is now midnight, then life first appeared at about 6 a.m. in the oceans. But what is astonishing is that life would only emerge from the oceans to colonize the land at about 10 p.m. That was when plants first appeared. For plants, this conquest of the continents would have been unimaginably difficult, for they had to colonize an environment so different from the sea where they'd been coddled in obstacle-free weightlessness now confronting naked, hard, sterile rock. But this virgin territory was worth the effort. It was abundant in that essential constituent of life, energy. This energy is what enables living beings to function, to develop, to move around. Since life first appeared, its sole raison d'etre has been to seize this energy and living things have become experts at exploiting it. I have so much respect for living things because each one is an incredible creation, so much more sophisticated than the most refined machine and so much more fascinating too. Bonjour. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now it's time for a well-deserved break. Let's yes. reconvene at 2 p.m. Thank you. Lorena. Lorena.
I hope you had a refreshing break. Now let's switch up gears and get ready to dive into a session that promises valuable insights on private sector's investment in climate action and its center around the innovative concept of climate tech. Leading us in this dynamic session, we're honored to have Helen, Helen Medovic, Head of Climate Change Advisory Services at IDB Invest, leading development innovative uh, strategies and implementing solutions to reduce the impact of climate change. She'll guide this conversation with deep insights into the pivotal role of the private sector and innovation in promoting climate action. Joining her with remarkable private sector experience, we have Matias Peire, co-founder and CEO of Grindex, Matias O'Keefe, co-founder and CTO UCROP, Angel Mejia, CEO at Inventive Power, and Laura Correa Saldarriaga, Sustainability Director for Odinsa. Ladies and gentlemen, let's warmly welcome this exceptional team of experts. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon to all of you, those in the room and those virtually. It's a pleasure for us to share this panel focusing on solutions, solutions that are already there, and opportunity areas to invest more by the private sector in climate solutions. We know that the world must decarbonize, must strengthen its resilience measures, and many of that, those things are technological solutions. But it's not that nothing has happened. Uh, there's been a lot of investment in technology, in climate technology. And part of our conversation this afternoon, as you'll see, is a combination of solutions or things that are already happening today in different sectors. Going from the venture capital sector, which seeks to invest in technology, to something that maybe we couldn't even consider when we thought of climate technologies, which is infrastructure. And from there, data solutions, continue with our conversation from before, and manufacturing solutions, one of the sectors that are probably the hardest to decarbonize. So thank you all very much for being here with us, for traveling from the south, from Mexico, from Colombia, to be with us here and share this conversation with us. Let's begin with uh, climate tech, climate technology. There are solutions or are there uh, potential solutions? So that there be potential solutions, we have to invest. And we have to find seed capital. Often we speak of how much needs to be invested in the seed capital. And actually the region has many entrepreneurs and many funds that are growing much more than one could even imagine initially. But there are also many challenges. So the first question is for you, Matias. Tell us a bit of the business model you're using in Gridix. What was the initial idea and, and how far have you gone? Well, thank you, Ellen, for this presentation, the invitation to this wonderful event which is reaching so many corners of the world. To answer your question, I think it's interesting to clarify one thing, and that's that when we speak of climate tech, we're talking about two different things which are included but are very different. One is the climate tech related to the digital word, and whatever we can digitalize to help us uh, run that race. And the other is what we need in terms of changing the productive aspects and the things related more to atoms than to bits. That's in the conversation we're in, to bring new things that displace practices that are sustainable. And in answer to your question, we thought that we felt, well, we felt that in Latin America there was a untouched 
scientific potential to find solutions for this conversation. We have a scientific system of 300,000 investigators, 200, 000, 200 of which are related to life sciences, and we practically have no companies from that ecosystem. And that makes no sense. We're investing in all the countries in developing those scientific capacities in the countries, but we need the next step, which is the transformation of that science into impact. We continue to need the basic science, but we need that additional step to take that leap. And that's what we're beginning to do. In this process of trying to connect cap science with venture capital, we realized that there were no startups in which to invest. So that's why we developed a company building model where we began to work very early with the scientists and their ideas and sometimes not even concrete ideas, but capacities that could develop solutions. And from there, helping them transform those ideas into startups. And in so doing, we connected them and helped them set up their co-finding teams with business profiles. As we say, we did a tin tender between scientists and entrepreneurs. And if it's magic and it's there and the love is all there, and there's the lasting commitment, then we have these couples that would last forever. They can be sporadic. These have to be long-lasting relations. We invest in the processes and we help them connect to the world and to other investors. This part is very important because, unfortunately, here, in this part of the conversation, the one of the atoms, there are no investors in Latin America who are investing in these things, who require the expertise and the logic and the understanding of the risk, which is very different from the digital world. And we have to go very fast, especially to U.S. and Europe, to find that capital that these projects will require. One of these technologies, which I know is of interest to you, uh, which m that led to the perfect match. Anyone you can give an example? Oh, I'm, I'm afraid. I mean, you know, I'm afraid to offend. Well, I'll, I'll risk it. I will say that a company called Puna Bayo, which came up as a result of Maria Eugenia Faria, um, an exper uh, um, very experienced scientist exploring areas of the world with volcanoes and the Antarctica, Antarctica and planes that were where life is very difficult had been studying that trying to find what the what are called the extremophilus uh, bacteria which can develop under these extreme conditions of salinity or UV rays or temperatures and she was an expert in these. She understood these uh, bacteria. And she had conversations with other startups that weren't into climate but needed those bacteria. She saw that the startup was working well and that the scientists had changed the whole habitat. And they said, OK, I want mine now. So she applied to our program. And, and she did it with two of the ones that had been scholars of uh, her program, and the three of them applied to the program. And in the process, aside from the tender, there were a lot of things, and the scientists began to understand where they could apply their science to, and they met Franco martinez Levis, who was doing an MBA in Wharton and was working, and he was well on the way to success, but he decided to make his life very complicated by going to work with them and do the startup. They um, founded Puna Bayo, and they developed biofertilizers with these extremophilus bacteria. And today, they're able to reduce the applications of nitrogen, of synthetic nitrogen. And, and but I know Matias is going to talk about this as well. Uh, in the soil, and there are biofertilizing alternatives with our consortiums of bacteria which allow the seed to capture the nitrogen or the phosphorus and the nutrients from the soil. So with these bacteria, they're able to optimize the capture of nutrients uh, when compared to other bacteria cocktails that are used 
elsewhere. And then at another program, they went to the United States, they got more capital, and now they're selling these biofertilizers in Argentina, and they're testing in Brazil and United States. And the fact is that the technology, not only as biofertilizers, but as other possibilities of the technological package in agriculture can really be useful. So it's a real interesting startup that's had, having a tremendous impact, and I'm sure will continue to have act, impact in these transformations that we need. Thank you, Matthias. I was not only surprised at the fact that it's a biofertilizers as a solution, but also that it's led by women, which I find a very important characteristic in these startups. And I also like the expression of uh, joining someone who decided to complicate his life. And I think that Angel also decided to complicate his life when he began his company 13 years ago. You had this idea of using uh, technology to reduce emissions in a very difficult sector, manufacturing. And you'll tell the specific technology in a minute, but I'd like to ask you to tell us a bit about your lessons learned, especially for those who may have ideas to replicate the experience in inventive of inventive power. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, first, thank you very much for this invitation. And um, yeah, it's a bit of complicating our lives because inventive power arises while I was at the university still studying, and it was a final project of my career. I was studying uh, mechatronic engineering. And at the time, of course, I was beginning with all these solar energy projects, and we knew that there were solutions to generate electricity through solar panels and all that, but there wasn't a specific solution to generate steam or hot water or hot air, which often are used by these industries in many of these processes to manufacture different products. And usually this is done by burning fu fossil fuels in those uh, boilers that they have in their facilities. So often what we say, especially in the case of Mexico, that we only have one single enterprise generating electricity. And you have no choice but to to use other types of energy, but the one that they send you. But a company does have the possibility of deciding what type of fuel or source of energy they're burning in their boilers. That's definitely in the hands of the company or the factory. And that pollution remains in the cities. The factories are in the cities, and we're emitting CO2, which we're all breathing every day. So. We found that niche in the market, and we decided to develop a solar concentration technology whereby we could generate hot water and steam for industrial processes, saving fuel in the boilers. So it was a really difficult process, a book entrepreneurial process, which comes out of the university. And we took it to the incubator in some of the companies of the university. And I think that all of these uh, enterprise uh, incubators that exist in the different universities, and there's many very good ones throughout Latin America, to strengthen my co-founder and myself, both come from a technical background. And often these incubators help us have the necessary training in other areas of entrepreneurship like finance, administration, and all the things required for an enterprise. Often, you can have a very good solution, but in the end, you have to see whether it's feasible in the market, and, and then also getting the capital, how to sell the idea, how to have the value proposal. So all of these things were difficult. We have some business accelerators as well, and from there, we jumped to the venture capital stage with some funds that we have in Mexico, and they invest throughout Latin America, and they've helped us as well. There were some government funds that we had in the government. We don't have much of that now in technological development, but at the time there were some programs through CONACYT, which is the National Science and Technology Council of Mexico, where they contributed to companies to help develop technologies. And there was a specific program for 
green technologies and climate change. So based on our experience, I thought it was the ideal moment. And I think that this is just the right time to deploy all these technologies in the market. And uh, there's investment, there's demand. We've seen many corporations operating in Latin America that are from the US or from Europe that are trying to find solutions to decarbonize the industrial processes. And our technology, as well as many others, help that all these products we consume leave a small carbon uh, footprint. So I see that we can uh, find solutions to decarbonize the industrial sector, which is the one that most contributes to emissions. Or I should say that it's probably one of the difficult, the most difficult sectors to reduce emissions. Is, and we have to be investing in these solutions continuously in order to achieve the decarbonization. Another sector we often think of when we think of decarbonizing sectors is the infrastructure sector, the roadway and the airport, airport uh, infrastructure in particular. So we've invited Laura to ask her, uh, tell us a little bit about Odinsa. It's an infrastructure company, but you launched a plan for decarbonization. You're highly committed with um, goals and processes uh, that are based on science. Tell us a little about what a little about Odinsa, your achievements, uh, and and where you want to go. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. Odinsa is a company, as you said, for roadway and airport construction, part of the Argos Group, which is an infrastructure holding in Colombia with another two businesses, cement and energy, and it has a presence in the United States as well as in another 17 countries in America. In Odinsa, we work on structuring and developing infrastructure uh, transportation products. And as part of our uh, sustainability strategy, which we've called our common journey, we're convinced that we have to eliminate that dilemma between development, sustainability, particularly from the point of view of infrastructure, which is an inevitable motor for development. And we're betting on developing low carbon infrastructure, resilient to climate, and whereby through voluntary projects and, and, volu and mandatory compensations, we try to generate capacity in the territories that have climate resilience so that not only do we protect our infrastructure and ensure no interruption of mobility as a result of the climate changes, we're acting on whatever causes this uh, degradation. So with that objective in mind, we're aware of, the f aware of the fact that despite the fact that as infrastructure operators, we're not an emissions intensive company, we are in a sector, sector which is related to transportation, which does leave a very significant footprint, about 23% of emissions related to energy come from the transportation sector, and about 75% of the roadway infrastructure due to the emissions of heavy vehicles during the construction stage, as well as from the emissions generated by the passengers or the users of our roads, our cargo roads. So part of the infrastructure Maybe the one that has the least impact, which is the railroad infrastructure, only 3% emissions, but the rail, but the maritime and the airport also has about 11%. So we're in a sector that has enormous challenges and plays an important role in the decarbonization process. Fortunately, we see that in the sector there is a great deal of awareness and there's a roadmap. Airports and airport operators have agreed on a goal of reaching zero decarbonization, in zero carbon by uh, 2050. As Ilan has said, we are developing a decarbonization plan. We have a science-based goal. We were the first Colombian company in achieving certification of the goal in 2021, and we're planning to reduce 68% of our emissions related to fuel consumption 
or energy consumption. 68% by 2030. And 99% of our emissions are due to the uh, third uh, goal, which are the ones related to the materials that we use for construction. And 65% the use of the infrastructure. So as you said before, we have to think as a group, as a network. For us, working on reducing the emissions is very important, but in a collaborative way with the whole infrastructure chain so that we can have an impact on one sector and thus not only have us reduce our own emissions, but have the whole chain reducing emissions. Just to give you some practices that we've been implementing in the roadway as well as airport concessions, I'll tell you that we've been using technology that goes from the replacement of uh, traditional light lighting with the LED lighting. We've also used solar lighting in the airports and in the roadways. We're beginning to use an analysis of the use of our, of our infrastructure to make the co electric energy consumption more efficient. We've identified the patterns of what sector is more uh, inhabited at what times during the day to make an efficient use of the consumption, for example, of the air conditioning, which is close to 60% of electric consumption in an airport. And in this way, make the use of the infrastructure much more efficient. I'd also like to mention that the implementation of the different measures have helped us reduce, since 2018, 77% of emissions in airports, like the El Dorado Airport in Bogota, 51% of the emissions in the airport Mariscal Sucre in Quito, allowing these airports to obtain certifications within the framework of a sector initiative, which I was telling you about a minute ago, of airports by 2050. And uh, working within our sphere of action, this means that we have to work in collaboration with third parties. That's why the use of the information is not left only in analyzing our consumption patterns. We're also doing it for third parties who use our infrastructure to see how the whole team that serves the uh, ships in catering or use of consumption can review its use patterns and improve the airport efficiency, and also reduces the emissions. As you see, we have been working to improve the existing infrastructure so that it's the most efficient possible. And we also believe that the development of the new infrastructure in the sectors and regions like Latin America will be fundamental to contribute to reduce transportation sector emissions. Uh, a lot has been said about what the airports or the roads it can do and whether it can be sustainable. In fact, there are conversations about what requirements there are to make these projects financeable or fundable. And we have to realize that our region, the reality of our region is not comparable to other countries. And here in the region, for example, the development of infrastructure makes the transportation process much more efficient with the reduction of uh, uh, travel times. So we have to revisit the new infrastructure and see what's the most efficient way possible to work with it and the new project that we're developing. Thank you, Laura. There were three words that I want to highlight from your comments. You spoke of science-based goals, data generation, and certification. But for that, we have to be sure that the data and the certifications are valid, are correct. And I think that the technological solutions like uh, the one you're going to tell us about, Matias, could be an area not so much in infrastructure, because in your case it's more a question of traceability, but we're continuing to see financial instruments related to KPIs. In fact, it was said that the IDB has launched a program called Bit Climate, IDB Climate, which is generated, is related to the SDGs and the KPIs of the objectives. But we need to know that we have the data and that we are achieving the goal. Tell us a little about UCROP and what you 
look for with that technology and those solutions. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yes, we went through all those stages. In fact, we began with a pretty easy project with traceability in agro for different specific fee purposes relating companies with producers. And as we advanced with the projects, we realized that the companies, well, actually two main things. One, that the most of the work was in the hands of the producer, the change, the change of practices, doing things differently. All of that was something we asked from the producer, but the producer is not receiving clear indicators of why he had to do it. These were just long-term indicators, but without any explanation of what he would get to improve and make more sustain sustainable. So we decided that everything we had to do had to be done free of charge for the producer and that we would try to find incentives from the company so that the producer could have initiatives that meant something to him that would transform the long-term benefits into short-term concrete things. And with the companies, when we began to measure uh, and give them the traceability of sustainability, we realized that these companies, in order to do these claims for the achievements they were getting in the change of practices and what they wanted to tell the world, they were weak when the time came to show the information and say, look, I estimated this. Um, footprint, and they filled in a form, we calculated, and this is what I get. But all the information that was necessary to do the decarbonization as one example, but it could be any of the other practices we measured, when the company has to show this to the public, there's a lot of gaps of where they obtained the information, how uh, true it is, and we worked trying to see what was the governance process of the data, what was the uh, people's knowledge about these things and their capacity to really make those statements and how we could prove that with evidence. We set up a platform which, is, which focuses on realizing that the people have the right to use the land to understand where the land is, and then a traceability system which seeks to consider the, the, the things that have to be shown. Many of these are questions and documentation. But we're leveraging it with technology which allows them with satellites and satellite uh, reconnaissance, um, detecting, for example, 14 different types of crops so that if we say that this was done at this time in this field is something that we can prove with uh, something that validates it externally. We connected with the agricultural machinery to know that what was done there came from a specific machine, guaranteeing that the machine was there and, and planting. And uh, we try to find processes where we know the person, we allow them to sign, and the knowledge is, chain, is saved in the blockchain to um, to see something that's only independent for us, to show that it's it's something that we did. And for agreements between companies and producers, we find evidence that supports each one of the evidences. And we set up what we called the uh, crop story, a document that saves all the schedules of what happened from top to bottom, the identity, the uh, ideas, the evidence that was collected, so that when a company, based on that information, uh, does presents a claim, they can go back in history and show any auditor all the proof of how this was done. And then we added the question of the auditors. What we want is not to replace the traditional uh, auditors, but to reduce and simplify showing them what's happening without having to go out into the field to check. And we're working with the platform, allowing uh, control unions and Euroveritas and all the auditors so that the agreements between the producers and the companies allow them to come in and have all the documentation to test and confirm everything that happened in the field. In the things we're working with, I would say that one of the main things which we have fully solved today, which is the deforestation measurements and how they're planting 
near swamps and areas of high biodiversity. That's done automatically via satellite with things that I may explain later, but that has to do with the number of different uh, rules that there are and considering what is deforestation across to, according to Europe, if it's, is it biodiesel in the United States, or what type of applications, what is considered a deforestation, because there's no consensus in the world. So we're setting an algorithm whereby one can be very flexible and can adapt to what's requested by the, from the different things. Para que se puedan armar ecosistemas eh, donde una agrupación agropecuaria pueda sumar a todos sus productores y ofrecerles beneficios, atar empresas y que todo eso se vaya orquestando una tendencia de, de cambio positivo. Super. Eh, no, definitivamente una herramienta que incluso nosotros con nuestros clientes eh, buscamos proveer o, o a tool that we ourselves with our own clients try to identify this type of solution and one of the challenges is for producers to be able to provide that information and to become part of the platform knowing that there's a benefit for them there. So this idea that providing the data is not a, a problem, it's actually something that benefits the producer, that's an important step. Angel, I wanted to follow up with a question for you on this issue of information and knowledge. You work with companies and you have to convince them to adopt these technologies just as we want to convince them to be part of the platform because there are more benefits than costs involved. But maybe there is an initial cost, an upfront cost in technological change. What do you think are the opportunities for governments? Because you talked earlier about governments that support the development of businesses like yours. But what are the options of governments or banks such as ours to provide support for those technological changes? Well, yes, this support is very important. Businesses usually buy the energy, and it's an expense for them. You pay, even in your house, right? You pay for your electricity on a monthly basis. You pay your, your power bill. The problem we have in Mexico, because of the type of fuel that most of the country is using, which is LP gas, and we have tanks that someone comes and has to fill it up for you, people sometimes don't have this historical information on consumption. So that's an issue with data. Many of those companies just don't have the data that will allow them to make decisions. How much is that energy costing them? They don't really know. So all of this is upfront, the analysis, the technical studies, or conducting a whole investigation in the business where those uh, savings might be hiding. I think it would be important for governments to participate in all these programs, these energy research or study programs. There's a lot of opportunity there, especially when we're talking about SMEs. Maybe, com maybe many companies don't have the resources to do this. They have enough for the day-to-day -day, uh, operation of the business, and you're not thinking about these other matters. That's why I think these programs are so important. And then to the next point, uh, since you're paying your energy bill on a monthly basis, these green energies such as solar energies require an initial investment, so you need to have the equipment, right? And in two years, you will have a return on investment. However, what you can save up on two years will make up for your investment in solar energy, but not all companies, not all businesses have the capital to devote to this, to allocate you know, this big upfront uh, cost of the technology. It's like asking a person to pay their uh, energy bill for 24 months on the same day. So this support is necessary. And what we've done in Mexico is to partner with different financial entities non-bank financial institutions. We call them SOFOMs in Mexico. And these 
entities can provide financing or leasing schemes or arrangements where you can calculate that that monthly payment for financing that you have to make will be equal or less than the savings that you calculate the system will provide to you, solar energy. Sometimes it's not the same level of savings every year because of climate uh, conditions. And so in the case of the Northern Hemisphere, in, when in summer we have greater solar radiation, then in the rainy season it's less because of the clouds, and then uh, it's a little bit better in the winter again, but less than in the summer. We get less sun sunlight than in the summer. So we need financing arrangements with these financial institutions where the payment is also variable, taking into account these climate conditions in the savings that you generate so that you are always paying with the uh, same OPEX that the company already has for the energy bill. So you're not asking for an additional investment in order to have the, the equipment. And then there's another uh, initiative that we've been discussing here in the US and in Europe as well. Where, and we have a couple of projects in Mexico. It's a power pusher agreement. It's a it's a, basically a thermal energy sales agreement. It's like you're providing a service. The investor, together with us, we put in the, the technology into the company. We start operating the equipment. And the client is charged for delivered energy. And this energy now comes from solar energy, of course, with a cost based on gigajoule. And it's uh, less than they're actually or currently paying. That's why you need to have the study up front. And the entire technological risk goes to us as manufacturers and to the investors. And if for whatever reason, weather related or technological problem, if they, the system doesn't work for them one month, they don't pay. They pay only for the energy that they actually receive and use. So these are usually energy sales arrangements um, on a 10-year horizon, and this helps to reduce that fear of implementing this type of technology in businesses. And this, what you were talking about, these thermal energy sales arrangements and using innovation to overcome that uh, barrier that is that uncertainty, that fear of technological change. I think this is a very important concept because it's that upfront or additional cost, is at least what we see with our pli private clients, it makes them afraid to adopt technologies. And we need to use this type of arrangement so that we can convince them to do this and we can reach decarbonization levels. And this initial cost is also present when we're talking about infrastructure. They were talking about adaptation this morning. You always think about adaptation projects as uh, costing a lot more, a much bigger cost. But are there some areas of opportunity in adaptation and resilience for infrastructure? What have you seen, Laura, in climate risk analysis and infrastructure? Well, yes, as you say, in the decarbonization plan, we do find an opportunity, and it's one that makes sense for business. You were talking about savings, yes. But in adaptation, there's a big challenge here. In infrastructure, I think everyone knows that one of the main consequences that we see as a result of climate change is the fact that infrastructure is being impacted. And this is causing disruptions, not just in, in terms of public mobility, but in terms of uh, the movement of goods. And this is affecting the economies of our region. So in the framework of this common journey, this shared journey, we decided to try to understand how vulnerable we were, what is the impact that we should foresee uh, for uh, infrastructure. So we did a study on transition and uh, risk 
uh, up to 2022, and now we have that sort of assessment for all of our current projects as well as those that we are structuring currently. And I think the opportunity, and we're moving in this direction not just because of conviction by our group, but because there are frameworks and guidelines that exist already that give uh, companies uh, this uh, sort of uh, direction and force us uh, companies to understand what all vulnerabilities are and also give us methodologies, allow us to use uh, prospective and historical data to based on nine, eight, or 10 uh, climate uh, risks or threats, it helps us understand and quantify how vulnerable we are to these risks. And we are convinced that this analysis will be a great opportunity for us in terms of the development of new infrastructure projects where we can ensure that we have resilient structuring. And for that, the analysis of the data is uh, abundant and is available. And I think there's a huge risk in adapting already existing infrastructure. That's the challenge. I think that's the biggest challenge. And we think that there are still opportunities to develop these methodologies better, these risk quantification approaches. We have a lot of data. Now I think we understand the interaction between infrastructure and the environment, not just in terms of impacts, but in terms of dependencies as well. And I think this gives us a new perspective to help us think about infrastructure. And uh, here, coming back to what I was telling you before, how to ensure that the infrastructure is resilient. I can use containment walls, but that's not enough. I have to have an impact on the environment. So our carbon neutrality plan, it's based on science with an objective to 2030. We want to start being neutral by 2025. And we're starting to explore emission compensation programs through uh, planting uh, projects that contribute to generating resilience capabilities on the ground. We're working with an accelerator, an investment accelerator for cap carbon capture technologies to develop a 2,000 hectare project in the southwest of Antioquia, that's a Colombian region, and where we have a bank of projects to help us control the risk of um, increasing prices in the carbon market, but also in a way that makes sense for the region and for the infrastructure of the region. So that data analysis, we can capitalize on it, not just by thinking about how we can have more resilient infrastructure uh, or more resilient projects in terms of infrastructure, but also we need to look at all these interdependencies with the environment so we have better coordinated plans. We have to coordinate with public entities so we can contribute to uh, increasing the, the capabilities, the uh, capacity of the area. Yes, and you mentioned uh, something key. We need the data, but we do need the methodologies. And we're looking at a lot of different approaches, methodologies, different standards. As you were saying, there can be some discrepancies between some of them. So in a solution such as yours that includes traceability, how are you dealing with the fact that the standard is not yet defined, a single standard. We keep switching and the bar is being moved, it seems. What counts, what doesn't? Yes, the bar is being moved a lot. And, but I want to go back to something you said regarding uh, adoption by producers of, of these new things. We have traced over 2 million hectares with producers, and we don't see the limitation on that side. Once you establish a clear database with governance that is clear and the producers are quite sure of what's going to happen to that, then you're okay. Digitalizing a producer, the industry is paying 3 to $9 per ton right now for corn or soy for digitalizing that data. And for us, it's 30, 30 cents per ton. So that's how the bar is going down. And so producers are digitalizing and sharing that information with the industry for specific purposes. And the matter is you need to provide a lot of certainty about how the data will be used 
used. And I think the problem is on the other side for us, all the regulations and standards and how we're trying to learn. We went from talking about organic a few years ago, and that was translated later to carbon footprint. And then on the organic uh, aspect, we thought it wasn't quite as sustainable as we thought be because we weren't giving the land, the soil, everything it needed to recover. These are lessons learned in the industry, and this means that, uh, of course, standards are going to change as well. It would be tremendously useful, I think, if we could structure all this change that makes sense, but it should follow a, a continual improvement process with agreements behind it. So all the companies understand what they need to do to move forward. Each one is taking their own initiatives, going into different programs, and there are certain initiatives such as uh, GPI that are there to try to align targets. But all this noise uh, that there is with different standards and regulations means that, means that the entire industry uh, is does not have a clear uh, direction. If all that energy we could just spend it on trying to all head in the same direction, I think we could achieve it. And just as we did with our deforestation algorithms and uh, landscape understanding, which has a lot to do with the country. You can configure it based on the country, the uh, standards. We can use one for Europe, for biodiesels, for a particular industry. It's highly configurable. And so we're reforming the whole system so it can be extremely flexible and we can adapt to the 20 different ways of measuring regenerative that we have today or of measuring biodiversity. And we are doing it using clear metrics. What were the practices uh, in the field that, that were performed and through uh, data intelligence, we use it so that we it can adapt it to a specific purpose. So the foundation of what needs to be tracked is the same, but then you need to adapt it based on uh, all the certification that you're after. Thank you, Matias. I'll go on to the other Matias now. You have heard from C three different sectors and about different types of technologies. What is your reaction, or how would you compare this? And, and from three co different countries as well, how would you compare this to what you're seeing in the region? Where are you seeing technology being promoted the most? Where are there the most uh, promising environments for low-carbon climate technologies? Well, in general, what we see in Latin America is that we are technology adopters. At the different levels, when we talk about deep take or uh, more uh, or newer frontier technology, so to speak, we can be users of these frontier technologies for consumption to develop our countries. We can be adopters of those technologies. We're doing that too because these technologies are used to add layers of value. And then the other layer where we are now is where the most delayed in the region. And what's most difficult for us is to be producers of new technologies, developing those technological solutions that are not available in the world, but doing it from the perspective of our countries, not for the region only or our countries, because these are very niche things that require global markets to make sense. And since these are technological solutions to specific problems, they will uh, almost certainly solve the same problem in Colombia, Argentina, or Singapore, or Bulgaria. So I think here there is a huge opportunity. And in other fields, there are opportunities that we need to continue to accelerate and deepen all these activities that are taking place. I think they're wonderful. I haven't seen so many initiatives like this in the region. I think we should have more. But our focus is on this segment of saying, how can we develop these technologies that the world needs? And how do we conceive them from scratch from our region? 
The good news is that we have what we need for this in the region. As I was saying earlier, we have a critical mass of researchers in the region who almost all of them, or at least a great majority of them, are working in academia, developing basic science, which is fundamental, and their careers uh, are uh, aimed at uh, moving forward on the frontier uh, of science. and. This happens in the world, but usually in connection with the next step. What happens with that frontier knowledge? And what's the next step? How can the productive system make use of that knowledge that has been produced? That's what we need to work on. And on in matters of climate change, a lot more knowledge remains on the table than we need. But in Latin America, almost all the knowledge that is produced stays on the table in academic conversations and never makes the leap into the market. So we have to catch up as a region in order to participate in that conversation with the knowledge that we can produce technology starting from zero in the region. And when we're talking about Science, maybe these scientists never had the idea of uh, doing science outside of academia. Multinational companies don't do R&D in the region. National businesses, domestic businesses, even big ones, now some very large ones are beginning to do some R&D. But in general, national companies with national capital in the region don't do R&D because it doesn't make that much sense for their business. There's a bit more time to just follow others' uh, technologies and adopting them later. So there was never a demand from the private sector, from the produ productive sector, to hire scientists who are doing science outside of academia. So the scientific system adapted to this. It developed with the idea that the only way to practice science was within that academic framework. But today, with this uh, knowledge that is uh, more equally spread among everyone and in the new uh, environment in order to be competitive still, they need to look at what we're doing. And that's the big achievement that we can contribute today. We have 66 companies in our portfolio, companies from the region, and almost half of them have raised capital, over 80 five million dollars from different investors uh, and we don't know yet are we going to be completely successful with this model but they have raised the funds so that science from Latin America if it is correctly formulated it can be competitive in the venture capital global scene it's harder than in the case of science coming from the most prestigious uh, educational institutions in the world or other institutions, but the foundations are there. So we just need to get excited about it and understand that it is possible for our Latin American system to produce new technologies for the world. We're not talking about a big percentage. Let's think about 10% 10, 10 uh, of the investigators and scientists who work in the area. That would be about 30,000 of them. They can help with climate change technologies, or at least with the productive transformation on the planet, talking about the solutions for inequality, or 30,000 uh, researchers who are not able to make this contribution right now to what we need most urgently, which is to transform our production. And we see that it is possible and we do need to accelerate that process. Just to wrap up, since we only have a few minutes left, I'll ask each one of you to think about this context, that we do have a critical mass of knowledge and uh, entrepreneurial experience. There are larger companies that are seeking to adopt this type of technology. So what would be the main message 
from you for governments or for entrepreneurs who are listening in terms of doing this kind of work of formulating climate technologies for our region and for the rest of the world. Go ahead. Well, I see it as an ecosystem. We always talk about uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems where there are cities. Here in the U.S., we have Silicon Valley, those regions where an ecosystem forms, where there's an entrepreneur, there are researchers, venture capitals, buyers, uh, possibly as well, of these solutions. And that uh, makes the whole system more dynamic. And in Latin America, we are seeing the beginning of these ecosystems. We now have them in many cities, or maybe it's governments themselves that have promoted these in the case of Santiago de Chile, for example, and other types of initiatives also from the government. Where I live in Guadalajara, Mexico, there's a municipality, a Popan, where uh, an attempt is being made to form an ecosystem in that Guadalajara region with all these incentives in place for entrepreneurship so that all these people who have ideas, whether they're coming out of university or research centers, so they can bring their idea and uh, partner with someone with a different profile, maybe a business profile, and form a company with the support of the government and venture capital so that they can produce something in the end. And as we see in the case of infrastructure, they, they are, many they are anxious to implement some of these solutions. Yes, uh, along the lines of what we were saying, I think governments have a huge opportunity now to differentiate themselves with their local production since the government, is, uh, the world is asking for more. Even if they just facilitate the dialogue and they help those organizations that want to uh, determine and facilitate how are we going to measure this, how are we going to move forward as a facilitator of, e of ecosystems and as uh, and within that ecosystem there's a key player the catalyst of the movement, sort of when the wheel starts to turn, you need an initial force that is more powerful. So I think all the investment that we need for these changes, we need to think about it as the catalyst for the beginning of the movement. Once the ecosystem is in motion, everyone starts to see that return value, but they need that initial push. So it's good to think about it as something that can even have a return on the investment just for a greater impact. I can develop an ecosystem, have a return in the short or longer term, and I can continue to invest in this. I think we can generate a lot more with less if we seek these ecosystem benefits for the producer. I think, uh, thinking about governments, there is an opportunity, there is a chance. Countries are competing these days to attract talent. In the last 100 years, countries have been able to have uh, laws and regulations to keep these companies in the country. Now there's a lot more volatility, so you need to find other ways to attract that talent. And in the development of uh, new technologies in the world of climate change. We're just getting started in digital uh, infrastructure. Uh, all that was developed in the developed world in terms of the agricultural techno technology. All of this was developed in the developed world, and we adopted it. Now, uh, for the first time, we have the chance to create these technologies that will be used in 10, 20 years here, but we need to generate the skills and the, the ways to retain talent, not only that, but also attract talent in the first place. And it's a great opportunity because we're all uh, facing the same conditions. And coming back to what Angel said, I think the message is that in the private sector we're anxious to continue to advance with the decarbonization strategy. I think we need to develop a joint agenda so that 
the arrival of hydrogen, for example, to, hi to aviation is possible, so that the massive use of electric vehicles is something possible and the impact associated to it be a um, solution. I think we're all willing, and I think it's only possible if we do it together and if we work in networks. And finally, that we hope this is not something volunteer so that it won't be just the exception. Speaking of infrastructure, like transportation, for example, which in the end is a public good, of which the leveraging of development depends on, should not it should not be voluntary and should not depend on the vision of one company or a private entity, but the characteristic that the whole infrastructure development is considered. So we hope this advances also in a regulatory fashion so that it's mandatory for everyone. Thank you, Laura. And I'll end by saying that I hope you leave this panel thinking that there is an action, that there are solutions. There's still much to be done, but we're on the right road. And we have the will. We want to work together in this ecosystem we were talking about. And we hope to be able to continue to find solutions. And we have both the will as well as the resources and the knowledge, in fact, in the region. Thank you all very much for joining us. Gracias, gracias, gracias. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, to the close of today's sessions, thank you. I want to extend my gratitude to each one of you for your active participation and engagement. Tomorrow marks the final day of Knowledge Week 2023. And we have an exceptional lineup in store. From start lessons to listening to voices from the field, we have an array of enriching sessions planned. I look forward to seeing you all there, here. Before I leave you today, I'd like to give you a reminder. First, we value your feedback and encourage you to participate in our survey. You can access it by scanning the QR code on the screen or following the link in our social media chat. Your input help us improve. Also, don't forget that by attending the Knowledge Week, all the Knowledge Week sessions, you can earn digital credentials. These credentials are recognized testament to your participation in this event, whether or online or in person. At the end of each session, you'll have the opportunity to receive one and become a part of our vibrant community. Have a great evening.